Welcome to Spartan Mag Live. My name is Jim Caproni, publisher. SpartanMag.com. Had a little problem there. Kelly Spartan, thanks for calling. I know you were going to say I figured it out as we're ready to go. Anyway, got the sound going. Great to have everybody in. Come on, file in, file in. Let's talk some Michigan State sports. Michigan State University, the home. Michigan State Spartans. Ranked number 13 in the country by the Associated Press basketball team. Your basketball team, 17-4, and 8-2 and two after beating Michigan and Maryland this week. Football team is still, what, 11-2? and two? Finished number 10 in the country. Beat Pittsburgh in the Peach Bowl. I know a lot of you appreciated that one. Don't mind mentioning that here every once in a while. Spring football is going to be coming around the corner pretty soon. Winter conditioning going on. We've got a question or so about that here in the mailbag that we will be getting to. If you don't know what this nonsense is, my name is Jim Comproni, publisher, SpartanMag.com. SpartanMag.com is your source for full Michigan State coverage and analysis, football, basketball, recruiting. The Underground Bunker Message Board is the daily narrative on Michigan State sports, the church of what's happening now for Michigan State sports. And over at the Underground Bunker Message Board, I invited Michigan State fans to post questions, and I will be fielding those mailbag style. Feel free to put questions over in the chat area also and we will be getting to those as we move along and uh if you don't know what spartanmag.com is it, it's the michigan state site covering michigan state sports been doing it that way over there since the beginning of the internet and it's this the site uh that you can depend on for coverage and analysis been doing it over there since the mid 1990s and over at the underground bunker message board i invited michigan state fans spartan maggers subscribers over there to post questions we'll get to those in a minute in the meantime give us a thumbs up subscribe to this channel as we get closer to 5500 we'd like to get to 6000 by valentine's day if possible did i have a uh i was hoping to get over 5200 by groundhog day right and it happened Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And go over to SpartanMag.com and consider becoming a subscriber over there also. It's a premium website. There's a cost for that. Uh, we've got full-time writers. We've got some part-time writers. And that helps fund our news organization as we try to cover Michigan State sports in a way that uh, is worth paying for, quite frankly. And we appreciate all the support we've gotten over the years. So, hey, let's go to question number one. What do we have here? we got Pierre. His name is Pierre St. Pierre from Bremerton, Washington. He posted this over at the Underground Bunker message board. He says, what changed with Ma'a Nate Ote entering and then exiting the portal? We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, in a few minutes, Paul Konerdijk is going to be calling. We'll be talking basketball. Big Don. Don, thank you for the personal sponsorship here tonight at SpartanMag.com. Uh, in the tip jar, really appreciate your support, Don Straight. As far as my, uh, or sorry, we're gonna have Kona Dyke calling pretty soon, talking about your Michigan State basketball Spartans, seventeen and four, getting ready to play Rutgers this weekend in New Brunswick, New Jersey. We'll talk a little bit about what Izzo had to say today, what went on in practice today. Talk a little bit more about that uh, with Kona Dyke when he calls in. Been covering, he's been covering basketball with me at Michigan State for several years. I don't know, geez, fourteen years. Kona Dyke's been doing it. We've covered a number of Final Fours, and. Uh, NCAA tournament games. We've been watching it closely for a long time. We'll talk basketball with Paul. I think we're going to have Big Movie calling in uh, about 45 or 55 minutes into the show tonight. We'll talk to Big Movie about some things. As far as Ma'a Nate Ote, you know, it's, it's just a deal where, um, from what I understood, you know, Michigan State goes out of the portal. They bring in Aaron Brule from Mississippi State, Jacoby Winman from UNLV, you have Cal Halliday still around. And Ma'a finished the season as the number three linebacker, would have become number two with Noah Harvey moving on, bring in some guys from the portal. I think that kind of uh, freaked him out a little bit. And when he initially decided to leave, it was about six degrees Fahrenheit here in East Lansing. So did that enter into it also? He's a Sunshine West Coast guy. Um, might not be loving our frigid Michigan winters right now, and it's a good one. It's a dandy of a winter so far this year. I'm liking it. I'm enjoying it thus far, as a matter of fact. So he'd reconsider. Now he's pulled his name out of the portal, so he's going to compete now in the spring. We'll see what happens there. But the indications were he maybe just didn't wasn't ready to compete against the incoming. But he's back and uh, helps the linebacking depth heading into the spring as Michigan State tries to round out a top 11 for next year. Four-star recruit, used to be. Made an impact on special teams and became the first linebacker off the bench 
uh, by the end of the season this year. So what changed? Not really sure. It's hard to find out. You know, I've talked to some people on the inside a little bit. You know, the, the, com the com competition thing kind of, I don't know if freaked him out is the right word. He just wasn't real keen on that whole thing. But, you know, I, the question is with some of these transfers, like JT Daniels, is that his name? The transfer quarterback from, he leaves USC, goes to Georgia, does not start. Now he's transferring again. You're supposed to be able to transfer once and play immediately. Is he going to be able to play immediately somewhere else? I'll be interested to see if the NCAA has any bite on that rule or if we're just going to see players just transfer, 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 immediate play, immediate play, immediate play. With Nate Ote, I mean, that's a guy that transferred three times in high school, came to Michigan State. If he had gone to another school, that would have been his fifth school in five years. And if they're going to enforce that rule, then um, you use your transfer up early and then later in your career, you'll have to sit out. I don't know if that's a factor or not. Let's go right to Don, Don's question from DeWitt. We'll get into this a little bit, and we'll probably hear from Paul in a minute, but this was also piggybacked off some other, some other questions over there in the, in the, over at SpartanMag.com in the, the mailbag, Underground Bunker. Three questions I received about Jim Harbaugh and that whole situation. Uh, question number one, and Don has one of them, one of them and Don's question... Uh, was, uh, Don, please give us your take on Captain Khaki's excellent clown show from the People's Republic of Ann Arbor. He says, also, do you agree, agree with me that the preemptive strike to sign Mel Tucker to a long-term deal was masterful in its timing with all these pro jobs open? Bravo to Alan Haller, says Don, and all involved for the foresight to give him NFL money now and at least take that aspect off the table. That's from Don in DeWitt. Um, I think... I don't know what the going rate for a coach is in the NFL right now. Is Tucker not making more than NFL money right now, possibly? And you're exactly right. It was only a matter of time before NFL programs started coming after Mel Tucker, especially with the controversies that are bubbling out of Miami at this, at this juncture. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk that LSU was interested. That was overblown. That was uh, agents at work and playing the media like, like a fiddle. And Michigan State answered. Now, LSU, I don't think, was... Uh, as interested as was reported, they obviously wanted Lincoln Riley and uh, probably Napier and, of course, ended up with Brian Kelly. But if Mel Tucker had not ended up as, at LSU, which turned out to be the case, I think as the dominoes fell, I think Oregon would have made a real hard play for Mel Tucker with all that he does as a, you know, an ambassador for a school's brand and a Mel Tucker's shoe game. Um just uh, the way he presents himself and his team's brands and logos and colors and all those things. I mean, that would have been right up Phil Knight's alley for the Ducks. But when Oregon came open, Michigan State already had Mel Tucker signed. So, you know, I agree with you that um, Michigan State's preemptive strike is looking better all the time right now. And the things that Mel Tucker has done since signing that contract, winning the bowl game, beating Penn State, finishing off a recruiting class, and just see in his day-to-day -day business, you know, on social media, um, yesterday's, yesterday's signing day, interviews that he does. You know, I, I saw him over at the high school coaches convention, the Michigan High School Coaches Convention in Lansing. I thought he was outstanding there. I mean, it was basically Mel Tucker in concert over there. I mean, tons of energy. And those high school coaches were getting a kick out of him. Call from... Paul Conendake. To accept, press 1 to send a voicemail. So, Don, we appreciate that question. Now let's go to our very special guest, Associate Editor, Spart Associate Editor SpartanMag.com, longtime Associate Editor, my good friend Paul Conendake, and talks Michigan State basketball here today. Paul, how you doing tonight? I'm doing good, and, uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting basketball season. There's so much so much to be played yet and this team is kind of moving in the right direction and there's a lot of growth to be had yet it's it's exciting I want, i'm eager to see if time as gets this team to its ceiling we've seen it happen so many times before but there's a lot to like with this team so far i agree it's been fun and they can and that, that's what that's what college basketball is all about it's it's 30 games get your crap together 
And in most seasons, it's been an interesting odyssey to watch Michigan State work on things and try to bring everything together in time for the tournament. Last year, they were just trying to get into the tournament, but five of those weeks were spent, of course, without Tom Izzo, uh, you know, two and a half weeks while he was out with COVID and another two and a half weeks while the team shut it down. But now Michigan State, 17-4, and 8-2. and two, Excellent season thus far for a team that was not placed in the top 25 in the preseason playing really well right now number 13 in the country coming off that 65 63 victory over maryland but before we talk about uh, what's happened lately let's talk about what happened today tom Izzo had a zoom press conference today and tom and uh, paul konerdyke put that video over at spiremag.com and you can find it here on the the youtube channel um audio was not great but uh that's the way that we we received it but um because of the snow, we had about 11 or 12 inches here in East Lansing, a lot of school closures and so forth, rather than opening, opening up practice and having post-practice press briefing this week. They just had it via Zoom. So this week we were not able to watch practice, unfortunately. But Izzo said it was a great practice today. He doesn't always say it was a great practice. I really would have liked to have been there to watch it. But he said it was a great practice today. And he said they did the war drill three times today. Or as he says, they played the war drill three times. Now, in Izzo math, that maybe means they did it twice. But I don't know. Maybe he's telling the truth this time. Maybe it was three. And that's part of why he said today's practice was great. He felt they got after it in terms of rebounding. And they need to, Paul, uh, getting out rebounded against Michigan. And offensive rebounds, again, a little bit of a problem against Maryland. Maryland offensive rebounding at a, a rate over 35%. Izzo that's blasphemous for the time Izzo program. Izzo wants to get this stuff solved. Your thoughts about what you heard about Michigan State's practice today and the direction of really ultra-emphasizing rebounding at this stage. Yeah, beyond what you said, he also mentioned that Gabe Brown shot it well today. Now, maybe that's wishful thinking. We've heard that in the past when guys have been struggling shooting like Gabe Brown is, but but that's uh, you know that's one of the things that he said as well today. The rebounding piece is something that's kind of, I, I know it's got to frustrate him. Uh, and, and I'm starting to wonder to some extent if, it, if it's a pers- personnel thing. You know, he's got some, some bigs that aren't um, necessarily great rebounders. Um, you know, Marcus Bingham is probably rebounding as well as he can, but he's still a little bit light. And I know he's a lot stronger this year. He's, he's a lot better rebounding. But one of the things that he needs to do is the fundamental rebounds. You can't rebound it one-handed in the big time. It just doesn't work. you got to have two hands on that ball. Uh, and then you look at a guy like Julius Marble. He's built similar to what Xavier Tillman was built like, uh, but he's not a rebounder like Xavier Tillman was. Uh, he's doing his best, God bless him, and uh, and he's coming along. And he's had some good some good moments, but it seems like Michigan State doesn't have uh, a big man that you know that, that can get a, go out and give you ten rebounds every, every night like a Draymond Green or a Raymar Morgan or someone like that. That's just gonna you know even a Kenny, Kenny Goins. Um, you know, so I think some of it's a little bit of a personnel deal, but Michigan State's got to find a way to rebound as a team collectively uh, and do it at a, do it at an efficient level defense on the on, you know on the defensive end, so they can get out there and, and have some consistency in transition. Because what you're seeing in Big Ten play is you're seeing teams do what teams always try to do to Michigan State uh, with the anything but transition offense rule. And the best way to stop Michigan State from running 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 uh, the ball at will and scoring transition points at, at will is uh, is out-rebounding Michigan State. You take away that defensive rebounding component, and that, that's the best way to defend against transition offense for Michigan State. I agree. And that Michigan game, Musa Diabate, who rebounds about 6.5 per game, was really, really good on the offensive glass, 6 or 7 rebounds, offensive rebounds. And going back and looking at it, he just outworked Michigan State's players three different players on three different occasions one time Bingham one time Hauser and the other one was either Hall or Marble I can't remember but he just he just went harder to the glass he made first contact he got his rear end lower than the Michigan State player gained position and got the offensive rebound the old-fashioned way and that's a freshman in the Michigan game from Paris France coming into the Breslin Center and out-rebounding Michigan State big men, three different big men, three different occasions. I'm sure that didn't go over well in the film room, but then Maryland went out and did, did more of the same. Um, you know, Michigan State, when they've rebounded really well, they've, they've uh, you know, something Izzo said today, they want to get some gang rebounding. They want some guys to get rebounds out of their area. Those range rebounds he's talked about because some of the missed three-pointers are becoming offensive rebounds for the opposition. Gabe Brown is six foot eight, and, and Max... Christie at about 6'6", 
are a couple guys who could and should be excellent rebounders at the wing guard positions. They've been pretty good rebounders, hot and cold, hit and miss. But I kind of think that, like you said, the big men are not great natural rebounders. So you're going to need to get more out of those guys. Now, what he said was they're putting more emphasis now on uh, obviously getting the defensive rebound first before leaking out to get into transition. So I think the Michigan State's transition game, which Izzo wants to improve, might lose a, a little bit of RPM here in the short term as they emphasize getting the going and chasing and fetching that defensive rebound first and foremost, then getting out in transition, which means, you know, Gabe Brown and Christie, especially Gabe Brown, might not be exiting down that left sideline at 95 miles an hour like he normally does. They want him to stay in and help with that, clear that defensive glass. Uh, first things first, clear the glass, get the defensive board, then transition game. Do you think we might see, as I'm kind of thinking, you might see Gabe Brown, Max Christie, defensive rebound a little bit better, even at the expense of the transition game for now? Possibly. Yeah, I think, you, I, think, I think you have to because, you know, you say at the expense of, but at the same time, if you're, if you're, if you're leaking out too early – and you're you're relying on exclusively your bigs to 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 rebound, then you're not getting any opportunities at, at transition. So you might give up, you might give up maybe thirty percent of your, uh, you know, maybe twenty five thirty percent of your transition opp- opportunities. But right now, the way the Big Ten is, you know, uh, you know, Michigan State's not getting a ton of transition transition opportunities. So I and, and the other thing too is you're you know like if if you're given second chance points are given a lot of different scoring opportunities against good teams. Uh, you, you know, against good teams, those, you know, how often do you see like if there's an offensive rebound and kick out, it's a, it's an automatic three against good teams with veteran shooters, you know, like a guy like Brad Davison or something like that, or, um, you know, some of the teams Michigan state's played haven't done that, that to them. And Michigan state's played some pretty good, good defense, but I, I think, I think you have to, you have to get to the point where you can be a consistent defensive rebounding team. Uh, you know, before you can go break neck, break neck speed, and uh, because you're really hurting yourself if you keep on, and you're opening yourself up to foul trouble with, with your bigs if you keep on giving up. Uh, you know, if you keep on giving up uh, offensive rebounds, and, the, and then your bigs are, you know, are asked to defend at the rim over and over and over again, you're going to see a lot more foul trouble if that continues to be a consistent issue. Yeah, and Izzo made an interesting point. They're trying to catch up to the idea that. You know, there's just more three-point shot attempts in today's college basketball. I'm, I'm sure if you looked back seven, eight, ten years ago, ten, fifteen years ago, when Michigan State was dominant force in rebounding, not as many three-pointers were being attempted. Um, three-pointers were still a, a big part of the game back then, but I think it's been accelerated here lately. Uh, Nils Deco, who's on this show frequently, he knows a lot of people around the, the coaching game in all kinds of sports. He knows Billy Gillespie a little bit down there in Texas. Billy Clyde Gillespie used to be head coach at Kentucky. He's down in the San Antonio area now. And Nils shared with me that he spoke with Billy two, three weeks ago. And Billy said, hey, uh, the Michigan State rebounding thing, it's it's a three-point situation. It's a three-point shooting thing. That's had an impact on it. You you know, boxing out is different than what it was back in those days. And Izzo and his guys have kind of um, this year, just in the last couple of months, have, have adapted to that way of thinking also. Izzo said last week that they've changed the way they want to range rebound. You know, when you go to practice, you'll see tape on the court. You know, it might be an X out here, out in the left wing. It might be for an upcoming opponent. This is where we want our defense to get out beyond the three-point line for this team. Or here's a tape on the line inside the free-throw line, get back to the nail and transition defense. Whatever they're emphasizing that's, that week, sometimes it's the same points of emphasis all the time. Uh, you know, um, they'll have a cone or tape out at midcourt making sure that Gabe Brown and Max Christie get wide and down the sideline when running in transition. There's tape all over the court for a practice. New tape on the court now. Dotted, I think uh, I've not seen it, though, but as it's been described, I think it's inside the free throw line. That's where he wants to, for people to try to uh, be mindful of the defensive rebounds for long rebounds on three pointers. So, you know, that is part of it. Um, Izzo's quote today was as far as rebounding, he says, quote, some of it is my fault. We need to get more physical with our cutouts and we have to cut out deeper versus three pointers, unquote. Is this overblown about the three pointer portion of it? Or do you think long rebounds can help fix this? 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, long rebounds are always a you know are always a crapshoot. They're always they're always going to be. I mean, you see time, but they, I have seen a number of times this this year where you see your, the bigs are you know have done a great job cutting out, and everyone's in position where they should be. But the ball you know the ball's going right back, you know, right, going right back out in the perimeter, and you've got you know maybe a wing that's already kind of leaking out and trying to run down court, and uh, you know so it's I think it's something that Michigan State needs to consider. I think it's something they need to they need to work on. Um, but you know, I'm not sure if it's the, it's the, uh, be all end all for, for Michigan state, but I do think that you, I do think that you have to kind of look at what teams are doing. And, and I think, uh, the way Michigan state has been rim protecting this year, you know, Marcus Bingham's got that, that shot blocking presence inside, uh, Michigan state's guards are, are pretty long. Um, you know, they've got, they've got a guy like in Tyson Walker that can, can handle penetration and stuff like that. I think there's a lot of different reasons why. Uh, you know why teams would be more likely to to start hoisting threes against Michigan State. So I, I just I think it's one of those I think it's one of those deals. You know if you, it's like in you know in, in football if you're stopping the run, you know teams are going to throw it on you. And uh, you know I think Michigan State has made it pretty tough to score. Um, you have triple penetration with some of the rim protection improvements this year, and I think uh, you know there's a lot. I'm not sure if there's more three pointers being shot against Michigan State. But I'm guessing there is, and, and I think that's probably likely. And I think you've got to change. I think you got to. I, I think you have to explore different different things, um, you know, to to deal with uh, different situations. And I think that's a good thing that Michigan State's experimenting with uh, with their locations on, on on the rebounds. Yeah, it's it's. If you're a Michigan State fan, you you're happy that they've just broken it down and trying to find tangible answers on film and taking it to the practice court. Right. You watch games and you see it's uh, it's different culprits at different times. I saw Jaden Akins leaking out once, um, you know, and he's a mindful guy that wants to do the right thing. But, you know, I think Caleb Houston, I think, got him on an offensive rebound once when when Akins was leading was leaking out a little bit. Uh, Michigan State victory uh, in in College Park, Maryland, a couple days ago, 65-63. Paul Conadite called that when he said Michigan State was going to have a hard time with the Terrapins. And he was right. Michigan State ekes it out 65-63. Malik Hall, 16 points. Six of 12 from the field, one of one from three-point range. Malik Hall was the go-to guy late in the game, and he had the big move at the end to win. Um, interesting the way they did it. Uh, you know, timeout, 11 seconds to go, screen roll replaced, back to Malik Hall. Shot fake, draws the defender out. The fact that Malik Hall is a 50% three-point shooter, you have to come out and honor that. Shot fake, Izzo in the, the bench, Dwayne Stevens, they told Malik Hall, look to drive to score or get fouled. Shot fake. What I liked was shot fake, drew the defender, but also he did a sweep move, you know, sweep through move, long first step, efficient. That that right foot did not come very high, up high off the court. Covered ground quickly, quick first step. Shot fake, sweep through, quick first step. Gave him a half body length on Scott, I think it was, going to the rim, beat the help protector, the help, the help protector, the help defender at the rim, the rim protector to score. You guys saw what happened, game-winning points. But a lot of skill, a lot of fundamentals, a lot of mechanics coming into play there. But also, Malik Hall was the guy they drew up in the in the timeout during the huddle. They went to him three of the last five possessions in that game, and at the end, and he came through. Malik Hall, growing as a go-to guy. Paul, your thoughts? Yeah, and I think that you know we've been talking about this lately in podcast, vcast, what, what, whatever. But he's the guy that I think that you know can create his own offense at any time, just because of his skill set and who he's matched up against. And I find it ironic that he's he uh, won the game the way he did against a Maryland team that's always seemed to give teams fits with their own driving four men. Uh, you know, so he's kind of like a you know right out of the you know the old school uh, Mark Turgeon playbook kind of with their four man that drives and, and scores and whatnot. But Malik Hall is, uh, uh, you know, he's really yeah, really I think become that, you know, a we've guy been talking about this to score in a lot of different ways, and, and I think it's because his game is you know so diversified. He can't put the ball on the floor. He's got a tighter dribble than most four men. He's he's a good shooter. He's strong. He can score through contact. He's got, as you just pointed out, phenomenal fundamentals and footwork. And, uh, you know, he's like, when he gets the ball down low and he's going to, like, do one of his post moves or something like that, I'm not worried about – you don't worry about him being inefficient, letting the defender catch up. You don't worry about him dragging his pivot foot. He's just really fundamentally sound. I think the biggest thing for him is to get uh, to get to the point, and I think he's getting there, where he has the mindset that he is the primary scorer, that he is the alpha, that 
uh, when it matters, he's the guy that wants to score because, you know, he's even said it himself that he growing up and going through the basketball, uh, his maturation, there's never really been a point where he's been the dominant scorer. And uh, now, so it's a different type of mentality for him, but it's something that uh, to be embraced. And, uh, you know, Michigan State's four men were huge in that game. When we called doing some great things, Joey Hauser, um, you know, having a really, really big game for Michigan State. And I think it's something that has to happen, uh, you know, given some of Michigan State's youth um, at the guard and the wing positions and, uh, you know, some recent struggles with Gabe Brown, with him being in that kind of a semi-shooting slump. Uh, you need some consistency somewhere, and Michigan State got it from the four-man. Uh, we've seen throughout the years that when a four-man is uh, productive, Izzo can ride it. No one's better at using the four and using that stretch four. But Malik Hall uh, becoming a dynamic uh, difference maker, becoming a leader, a very good leader as a senior, uh, but also embracing that embracing that role of go-to scorer. And I, I don't think that's natural for him, but I think he, the light is starting to come on, and I'd expect to see more and more of that. And the beauty of it from, from my perspective is that you're going to be able to have Malik Hall do that throughout the season, and he's not going to be worn down like some other four men that have had to play 35-plus minutes a game and, and just get worn on, worn on, kind of like Draymond Green, kind of like Kenny Goins during the NCAA tournament. Uh, you've got two foremen at, at Michigan State, and so the minutes aren't, the minutes aren't overwhelming. He's a guy that's going to be fresh. And maybe some of the crispness in his game has to do with the fact that he's not a guy playing 35 minutes a game. That's a great point. And Hauser, if I'm not mistaken, was 5 of 6 against Michigan and 4 of 5 against Maryland. You know, Izzo invested a lot of minutes in Hauser, invested that starting job in Hauser just to, just to you know, push his buttons positively and keep him you know, showing some, some confidence in Joey Hauser. And sometimes Joey Hauser is not the most confident guy. Malik Hall, enough of a team guy. Malik Hall is the best power forward on this team. But bringing him off the bench, Malik Hall is mad enough to handle that. Because that's what was best for the team. Uh, Malik Hall's the guy that finishes games, and increasingly he's the one that's getting the most minutes at the four. But the 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 playing time and the care that Izzo invested in Hauser came up big in these two games. I'm not saying Hauser's always going to be scoring 14 and 10, but that's right around his sweet spot. You know, from three point range, two out of two against the Terrapins, and Joey Hauser was two out of three against the Wolverines. That's what they had envisioned. I mean, that's. You know, it's four out of five. That's, you know, that's 80% shooter. But they're they're hoping for a 40% shooter from three-point range. And he slumped earlier in the year in a lot of ways. But if you can have Hauser essentially being a 20-minute guy, guy at the four, you know, pick and pop or, or the roll replace, spacing out that floor, that's, that's what Izzo had in mind. And that's starting to come to fruition. And those two guys, Hall and Hauser, get along real well together. They complement each other real well. And anytime Izzo's had a Final Four team, Almost always, he's had a stretch four that can spread the court and everybody can operate off of that. Now, we, we talked about Malik Hall being a go-to guy at the end of the Maryland game. That's not to say he's going to become the go-to guy every single game. There's going to be times when Max Christie's going to be the guy. And going into the Michigan game, Michigan State had put in more plays with Max Christie with a ball in his hand coming off of ball screens. The first or second possession of the game, I think second possession against Michigan, they had him operating off ball screens. They had that deep in the playbook and the game plan did not have to use it that day against Michigan, but they wanted to do that against Dickinson when Dickinson started, you know, playing drop coverage on those ball screens, shacking it a little bit. You know, if you have Christie, so if, if, if the guy with the ball in his hands gets a ball screen and Dickin, Dickinson is playing deep and he's not coming out to affect the ball handler, rise up, shoot right there, 16, 17 feet. If you've got a real good point guard, that's good. You know, Tyson Walker's a little bit shy about taking that shot. Hogard, not, not a very good shooter. So if you want to take advantage of Dickinson's drop coverage, put the ball in Christie's hands That for that particular play. Didn't end up doing it much at all, but it was in the playbook. And Christie, you know, they've worked on that more and more. There'll be times when Christie, the ball's going to be in his hands at the end of games. This game against Maryland, I think Ayala was guarding Christie. So that's not the matchup you want to attack, I would imagine. But Christie, at some point with his skill, the way he covered, the way he carried the offense in the first half against Michigan, just because I'm saying Malik Hall delivered in this instance as a go-to guy, Christie is still a guy they're developing to do that at some point when the matchups are right. Correct, Paul? Yeah, I mean, if you've got a guy like Malik Hall that can create for himself and do things in so many different areas, then teams have to account for that. So when they do 
it's going to open up other other areas. I think one of the things that that you see with this Michigan State team, I'm glad you brought Ayala up. Michigan State doesn't seem to have problems, uh, you know, from a wing perspective when they're going up against uh, teams that don't have, uh, you know, like super senior uh, wings and guards. But you look at a guy like Ayala, who's a big physical muscular guy. He knows how to get away with some things like all veteran Big Ten defenders do. And and those are the type of t- the matchups that are that are tough for Max Christie because you know although he is stronger than he was uh, you know when when he signed with Michigan State and he's done a nice job in the weight room to get up to 190 he's still not as strong as uh, you know a guy like Ayala a guy like uh, Jamari Wheeler at at Ohio State so th- these are some of the things that these are some of the things that Max Christie is you know he's still learning learning the ropes as is Tyson Walker um, you know. At, and, you know, I think that one of the things that Tom Izzo did say today is he said, we're not a great, great team yet, uh, you know, but we're moving in the right direction. We're working to get there. And, and I think, uh, you know, I think the, the beauty of this Michigan State team or the fun thing from from uh, my perspective covering the team is that it's not a team that's already hit its ceiling. No. It's not a team where you're you're like, is Jer- you know, how, how, how much more can Josh Langford give? Uh, you know, can he keep this up or can, you know, uh, you know, can this other guy keep this up? It's a team that's young. It's it's got a mixture. It's young and old. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's guys that are even some of the old guys are still developing. You know, you look at some of the some of the hook shots Marcus Bingham has had, just a handful, uh, and you're like, dang man, if 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 he could uh, if if he could consistently get that shot off, if Michigan State's wings could consistently get him the ball on time or early to get that shot off, you look at a guy like Julius Marble, how look how good he looks with that with that hook shot. Uh, there's so many different pieces that, with this Michigan State team, and, and the, the ceiling is really high. Uh, it's just matter, it's a matter of making incremental progress each day in practice. And, you know, Tom Izzo, he was in a very, very good mood today. And, uh, you know, for this time of year, it's, it's not, it doesn't happen very often. So he feels like progress is being made. Uh, meanwhile, I think fans get a little bit frustrated with some of these close wins, but this is the Big Ten. And, you, and, you know, if Michigan State wins at Rutgers, this weekend, and that's no given. Rutgers has got some physical old guards and uh, some wings and some matchup issues, and that's a tough place to play on the floor. But if Michigan State wins there, they will have won, gone four and one uh, in their last five road games, which is almost unheard of. Uh, and for a young team like that, uh, you know, they should be you know they should be applauded. And there's good teams throughout this conference uh, that that are you know getting played tight by teams at the in the bottom of the conference. One of the things I think people need to realize is that Michigan State isn't sneaking up on anybody anymore. They're the team like they used to be uh, two years ago uh, when Cassius Winston was around that, that teams want to beat because that's how you get in the NCAA tournament, by beating a team like Michigan State. That's how you improve your, you know, improve your perception. Michigan State is no longer, uh, you know, I'm not saying they're doormat last year because they had some good wins, but they're not a team that, they're a team that people get excited to play. They're a team that fans get excited to see. It's the old Michigan State. It's a young team, but the name on the jersey still means something, and uh, this young Michigan State team is still learning how to handle that, in my opinion. I agree, and the rack's going to be jumping on Saturday when the when the Spartans visit there. And I agree that Michigan State's got a lot of individuals who've played some pretty good basketball, but we don't know what their ceilings are. Bingham, Marble, you know, Gabe Brown, touched on it a little bit earlier in the year, then he became a marked man in defensive scouting reports. And then I think he started to hurry his shot a little bit because his shot window yeah, he did. His, sh- his shot window started decreasing because he was a marked man. And he's got he kinda has a Reggie Miller temperament as a shooter now, you know, some some sloppy off balance shots here and there. Um, you know, but you don't want Gabe Brown finishing a game with only six shot attempts, but you don't want him forcing some of those hot potato catch and shoot 30 footers either or 20 footers. So they're working on that. And, you know, Gabe Brown in the last four games, three out of 17 from three point range is today in the zoom press conference said he's not worried, which is what Izzo usually says about shooters. He compared him to other shooters that have been in slumps. He says, you just shoot your way out of it. You work at it. He says, Gabe Brown is a worker. He'll be working at it. I guess what I'm, I'm getting at with, with Gabe Brown, I came into the season describing Gabe Brown, a kid that I've got a lot of respect for. Um, good heart and, and, and goodwill uh, toward his team and his uh, and his and, and the program, um, but I, I've described him as a streak shooter. There have been times when he's been streaky good. Last year, to his credit, he stepped aside and, and Josh Howard or Josh Langford took the starting job there. That should have been could have been Gabe's if Josh had not come back. So you know, Gabe lost some minutes there. 
uh, waited a year. This was uh, his year as a senior and started off really well and to the point where he was comfortably above 40 percent around Christmas going into January 1st to the point where I'm like, okay, he's no longer a streak shooter. He's, you know, he's two out of five most nights, three out of seven here and there. But now with this three of 17 streak, the shot mechanics have gotten a little bit wonky there a little bit. So I would go back to characterizing him as a streak shooter once again. And as this team aspires to meet its ceiling of potential, number 44 has got to be a big part of it as a deadly shooter and as a deadly finisher in transition and not somebody who's, uh, you know, someone, the fine line between being an aggressive scoring threat and being, you know, kind of a, a shot selection question mark. Three out of 17 for Gabe Brown in the last four games. And in the meantime, he spent some extra time on the bench coming down the stretch in the Maryland game. First time all year we've seen Gabe Brown on the bench in crunch time. Now the last two or three minutes he was on the court, but Izzo went with Jaden Akins there a few times with the, inside the last minute and a half. So interesting that Gabe Brown spent some time on the on the bench watching proceedings there, Paul. Because I know I know Izzo really likes Gabe Brown's effort, but that was that was kind of interesting. Well, I think one of the things that you see is I, I know Gabe Brown's long, and I know he's improved a lot as a defender, but he's not a very he's not you know he doesn't have the defensive quickness, he doesn't have the lateral ability, he doesn't have the defensive, you know, he's not as good a defender. Well, his length makes him, when everything's clicking, his length makes, and he's, he's scoring, you want him out there because he's a good enough defensive defensive player. He's better than Josh Langford was last year uh, as, a, as a defender. But Jaden Akins has is, is got some, some elite uh, potential as a, as a defensive player. Uh, you know, he has the ability to be the defender that, that Izzo always touted Rocket Watts to be, uh, you know. And uh, so I think, Aikens can give you something defensive and on defense. I also think Aikens is a better natural rebounder um, than, than Gabe Brown. I think Gabe Brown's going to going to figure it out um, eventually. And, and I and honestly, I, I believe that because nobody works. It's cliche, but really nobody works harder on their game than Gabe Brown. I mean, he's in there all the time working on his game, and I think maybe sometimes maybe he works too much uh, on on his game, um, but. Aikens has got some some pretty good pretty good ability um, defensively, and uh, and it's it. I kind of thought that you'd see his his minutes increase um, throughout the course of the year. So if Gabe Brown's struggling to make shots, and you need defensive stops, uh, I think Jaden Aikens is a guy that that you'd like to see in there. And and he made Jaden Aikens made a heck of a play at the end of that Maryland game. Maybe if he doesn't make that play, um, you know, on the on the drive. Uh, maybe maybe Maryland wins that game. So uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see what ha- what happens. Um, it, and uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if if Gabe Brown sees maybe those minutes stay down until he gets feeling comfortable again. You know, Izzo wants to find time for Pierre Brooks. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm not sure if that's I mean that's something you'd like to see, but I, I don't think I would say I wouldn't go as far as saying that Pierre Brooks is a better defensive player than uh, than Gabe Brown because I know that's no, not true. No. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, there's, you know, there's other, other options and maybe sometimes, sometimes when a guy's struggling, um, you know, it's, it's good for them to step back a little bit, but I think Gabe Brown will work his way, um, uh, will work his way back. And, and I've been impressed with him when he has played, even, even, uh, even, even when the shot's not falling, some of the things that he's done, um, you know, I, I think he's come so far since last year, you know, I remember last year I was sitting there and talking, um, you know, during a timeout or something about like, when is this guy ever going to, you know, take a dribble in one, one dribble pull up? When is he going to try to hit it? 17 footer? Is he ever going to try to drive to the basket? It was all three, three, three. Mm-hmm. The game is so much more diversified. He's put the effort in on defense. Uh, he's put the effort in as a rebounder. And I, I fully believe that he'll come around, um, you know, this year. But I think one of the, the nice things about what Michigan State's roster is like is you do have depth out there. So if one guy is struggling, you, you know, like if a, if a Marcus Bingham is struggling, Izzo can go and play the play the Julius Marble card, and we've seen that that in the past, and uh, that's one of the things about a, a deep roster. Um, and the thing about basketball is that that you know you don't you don't you know you usually have a chance chance at redemption. Gabe Brown's not to that point where he's struggling that bad, mm-hmm. but you know he'll have his moment. We've seen a lot of guys go through it in the past. I think he'll have it back. Sure, Max Christie bounced back in that first half against Michigan. That's an example right there. In that Michigan game, I thought it was really interesting that Michigan State became better 
when they went to the bench. A.J. Hogard and Malik Hall, two guys coming off the bench, and they became better against a Michigan team that in the meantime was tiring when they would leave their regulars in or they'd go to their bench and get outplayed with, uh, with, with not as much of a playing group. And then Hogard, you know, didn't play as well against Maryland. Now, here's my question about the point guard position. I'm just throwing out devil's advocate stuff here. Um, last year, I think we all agreed that Michigan State's big men across the board uh, did not improve, did not develop as much as they would have if they would have each gotten more playing time. Instead, that playing time was divided among six players when you add Kithier to it. And I guess it was Kithier the sixth. They've got, what, five now? Five big men or four big men? Five whatever it is. Did they lose someone else? Anyway, well, you got, you've got Malik Hall and, and Hauser, and you've got Marble and Sissoko and Bingham. That's five. Um, they're all coming along nicely now. Now at the point guard position, getting some inconsistency there. It worked out really well against Michigan with A.J. Hogard having a real good game. It was 11 points, 10 assists, only one turnover in that game. Hogard finished, played more minutes than Walker. This game against Maryland, Walker played more, and Hogard really struggled. Hogard 0 for 4 from the field. And uh, just just struggled in this game for whatever reason. Um, I, on one hand, it's good that Michigan State can go to a plan A or a plan B. Whoever's playing well, whatever the matchup is better in that particular game. But in the meantime, I can't help but wonder if one or the other is losing a little bit of development in the mere, in the near term. Long term, they'll both be fine. But in the near term, for this season, is you know the division of minutes there at point guard you know, delaying Michigan State from having the type of quarterback they're going to need in the NCAA tournament when you get to March and so forth. That's just me being a, just devil's advocate throwing an oddball worry out there. Paul, your thoughts on Michigan State's point guards, which need to develop, but in the meantime, they're, neither one of them is getting more than 23 minutes in a game usually. Yeah, they're not getting more than 23 minutes in the game, but you look at the point guard position overall and they're, you know, they're averaging they're averaging close to what 15 points and 10 10 assists a game. Yeah, okay? It's a so plus. it's a plus. You know, so so here's here's that. That's the one, one thing. And then I want to go back to I mean, we would like if we we saw some of the late, you know, we've talked today one of the themes in in the press conference or the Zoom call was uh was, you know, Michigan State being in close games. Michigan State was in a lot of close games last year and they lost, lost a lot of close games. Uh, and you've seen a lot of like nice point guard plays at the end of the game. Not nice point point guard plays that you expect, where a guy you know like you know a guy drives and kicks off to an open teammate or whatever, or makes a nice pass or read inside and or kick out or whatever things that you expect point guards to do. If Michigan State's point guards last year had done any of that crap, we would have been like patting him on the back and throwing him a party. Mm-hmm. It was terrible. Mm-hmm. Point guard play was so bad. Yes. So it's easy to look at what these guys mm-hmm. don't do well without without acknowledging the fact that these guys are light years ahead of where the point guard was last year. It was, it was piss poor. Mm-hmm. Pardon my, pardon my language. And, you know, and you've got some, you've got some young wings, uh, you know, so I wonder what either one of those guys would have looked like against, uh, you know, if they had played at this level last year with that Michigan state team with, with a Josh Langford, with a Aaron Henry. So that, that, that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, you look at AJ Hogard and everyone wants to start him at the Michigan game and, after the Michigan game, but one of the things that Michigan really is terrible at is uh, defending against the drive. That was always there because of, because of all the things we've talked about with, with their ball screen defense and the, those type of things. That was an easy game for A.J. Hogart. Maryland's guards are physical. They play, they play better defense than Michigan's guards. And, uh, you know, and I think, uh, you know, so some games set up better for di- different guys. I think both of those guys are coming. I think there's some infuriating things with when I watch AJ Hogard that need to get corrected, and and I think that it's on him. It has nothing to do with minutes played. I don't think it's going to correct it with minutes. I think it might correct it if he gets some taken away. But there's that one instance against Maryland where he just goes and drives in like he's in third grade, and I, you know when you're trying to teach guys how to how to, how to use a ball screen, you know, and, and Marble gets a foul. I think Marble got his fourth foul on that. And it's just a, something as stupid as him waiting for Marble to set the dang screen before he dribbles in. So there's some dumb stuff, and there's some stuff that needs to be needs to be fixed. But I think there's some good things as well. And I think I think the two things that those guys do, it, it's interesting. Is I think Hogard gives you Hogard gives you the big physical body that Izzo wants at point guard for defensive reasons. And I think by having that, he's going to prevent a guy like Tyson Walker who's a little bit more slight from wearing down. 
So let's say you give Tyson Walker 34 minutes a game. Is he ready for that? Right. Is he capable of physically of playing that? I don't think so. Is AJ Hogard capable of playing 30 plus minutes a game at point guard? I don't think so. I don't think I don't think he's mature enough. I don't think his game is advanced. His game is mature enough at times, and he's also a liability shooting. And so if he's on the floor, uh, you know you've got it. You, you know you've got some other other issues. And then you get if he's playing a ton of minutes, then you get caught, caught with some non non shooting lineups out there. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, I like. I think the the net positive from the two point guard lineup is is better than the negative with it. Are both these guys finished products? Heck no. They both have a long ways to go. Tyson Walker is still kind of in that mode that we saw Bryn Forbes in uh, before the light went on for him. Uh, you know, where you're learning how to play, going from a mid major to to a power five. You're learning how to play. Uh, you know, uh, Brandon. What, uh, what's his last name? Brandon Wood. Brandon Wood, Brandon Wood had the same type of deal. It's a, it's a, it's a, you know, you go from mid major to to power five, and yeah, there's a learning learning process, and so there's some things there. But I think both of those guys are have given quality minutes, and when you look at what what they give you collectively, if you can if you can just kind of correct a few of the things that are negatives, and some of those are shouldn't be that hard, like waiting for your big guy to set set a screen for you before you mm-hmm. start before you bowl in towards the hoop. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at the net positive and you look at where this point guard position was as opposed to last year, uh, you can see that Michigan State is well ahead of the curve mm-hmm. uh, and, and is it would have taken that in a heartbeat coming out of last oh, yeah. season, what he's getting at the point guard position. Yeah, so maybe they're better off uh, splitting it this way for both players um, short term for this year and, and, and long term as well. Maybe it's the best way. It's the way they're doing it. It's best for for the team, for the game, the next yeah. game and the last game. I'm just wondering when we get to March 1st, would one of them or the other been better off the other way? But maybe not. You know, like you said, you, but, but you know, like what situation. you say, Jim. Jim, you always say the unseen is undefeated mm-hmm. in kind of a sarcastic, sardonic kind of way. Mm-hmm. That's that's one of the deals with this. Well, you know, like you assume if one guy struggles, the other guy's going to be a superstar. That's not always, that uh, that's not always the case. Mm-hmm. Also, you know, the, on the other hand, you know, sometimes two point guard systems don't, or two two quarterback systems don't work. But the point guard position is different, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm gonna. It's gonna be interesting to see how the the this uh, it morphs a little bit. I suspect that, that you'll see a little bit more of those guys on the court at the same time. But for that to happen, I think Tyson Walker's got to get to the point where, where he's looking for his shot. The number one thing that he needs to do, he needs to have the confidence. He needs to, to be urged by his coaching staff and his teammates to fire that rock when someone goes under a ball screen uh, when they play defense on him. Because that's on, you know, for a guy that's shooting as well as he has and has been a good three point shooter um, in, in college. Uh, you know he's got a good-looking shot. He needs to use it and and not not uh, turn down open shots. I agree for that's, this team. That's something he's got to do. One of the things for this team to become as good as it can be that that needs to be part of it. On a given night, if you lay off of him, he's got to be able to just to uh, make you pay for that. And then they're they're uh, they're working toward that. It'll be interesting to see if they make some more progress there. Before I let you go, football wise, want to ask you about. Uh, uh, you know what you saw in the the Zoom press conferences yesterday. Uh, the you know Kalen Hauser, quarterback, uh, mid year enrollee. Also Alec Van Summeren, mid year enrollee, and Jeremy Bernard, mid year roll enrollee. All all four stars from various states. What was your takeaway? Did anyone catch your ear yesterday with the, some of those football Zoom press conferences on signing day in February? Yeah. Yeah, I think Kate Hauser caught caught my ear and eye because of the way he carried himself. Now, I've been around for a long time, and you see quarterbacks, and they all have a certain confidence level. Every guy going to a Division One program or a Power Five program is going to be confident, it's going to have had success. But there's something about the way he carries himself that's a little bit different. He reminds me of kind of like the of the self confidence that you saw from a Kirk Cousins. You know, when Kirk Cousins was being when he was being recruited by D'Antonio. Uh, most guys in his situation would have been happy to get a, a Big Ten offer. But, you know, Cousins was out there posting D'Antonio up on, hey, what are you going to do to make sure we're a Big Ten champion if I come there? You know, so that that, that tells you a little about the way Kirk Cousins was. And, uh, you know, he's got a little bit of that edge, that Peyton Thorne edge to him. Like, uh, you know, I'm going to outwork you. I'm going to do, you know, this and that. And I believe in myself. So he carries himself a little bit differently than some quarterbacks who are all confident, but he's got he's got an edge about him. And the thing I like about him is that, and he, he prefaced this the other day, is that he's been through a little bit of adversity. 
he was told as a sophomore coming off an elbow injury that he wasn't going to be the starting quarterback at a high school in Las Vegas, at Las Vegas Liberty. Uh, and, uh, you know, that he was probably not going to be the quarterback of that school moving forward because they had another good quarterback. And he, so he dealt with that, kept on working, went out and, and went to one of the, you know, one a, won a tryout at one of the best high schools in the country, St. John Bosco in uh, suburban Los Angeles. And, uh, you know, ended up having a heck of a career there while splitting time with another high level quarterback, uh, you know, and, and then come making his way to Michigan state. You know, a lot of you people out there already know his backstory, uh, you know, really meteoric rise over the summer. Uh, it's put in the work. I think he's got a ton of, ton of, uh, potential, but he's got the demeanor that I like in a quarterback. And he's also got, uh, you know, some adversity in his hip pocket. And I can't tell you uh, how important that is, I think, for guys at that position, because so often quarterbacks coming in have been starting for four years. They've been told how great they are, that they're the next this and that. And they haven't had to face the disappointment or, you know, get up off the mat. And that's something that they, every single quarterback that goes to college has to deal with. So, you know, hearing Kaden Hauser talk yesterday, knowing his backstory and what he's gone through, and his experience at playing at John right, Bosco, Paul, playing my, against. My, my phone was kind of giving out there a little bit, but I think we got you back. Paul, I really appreciate your time. We're going to move on now. I uh, really appreciate your, uh, your, your thoughts on basketball and football and, and all the work you're doing over at SpireMag.com. Have a great night. Okay, okay Paul? Yep. Thanks a lot. There he goes, Paul Konerdyke. Really appreciate him. Uh, we got a call there. Not, not, I've not had this problem with this short on this thing in the past. Anyway. That was movie trying to call call back. Let's see if we can get this thing. Actually, it's this. There we go. We'll probably get movie call back here in a minute. All right. Anyway, it's great to have Conan Dyke uh, calling in. Big movie called in a, a moment ago. And there he is. Call from Big Move. To accept, press 1. To send a voicemail, press 2. All right, let's go out to uh, East Lansing, Michigan, our own big movie. Ron Armstrong on the show once again. Spartan Mag live on a Thursday night. Ron, how you doing, my man? What's going on, cop? It's great to have you on the show. Appreciate you coming on. We got some things to talk about as far as Michigan State football goes. Uh, you know, th this, th this day and age, college football, something's happening all the time. All the time. And it's, it's fun to follow football and all the all the happenings and as far as the, the since the last time we had you on i'm trying to remember what some of the what some of the um the news items that we have were, taken past we yeah we were we were still waiting to see uh who was going to be our, our i think our dn's coach with what what had gone public you mm -hmm. know it's just you know uh, wrapping up the recruiting class and getting some some portal guys so i think it's, there's been some activity all right, and since then, Brandon Jordan was hired as defensive ends coach, something we alluded to at SpartanMag.com before it happened, and we've talked about it since then. But I've not heard what you had to say about this, Brandon Jordan, coming in uh, from an illustrious career as a defensive ends pass rush whisperer of the stars. Uh, he was used by 196 current NFL players, I think it is. Um, he was the guy that the, the all-pro guys – and the rookies and everybody in between, recruits, college guys, he was the go-to if you wanted to work on your pass rush skills. Um, played at a small college level, coached briefly at Austin P and a couple other small college levels, set up shop in Houston, Texas as um, a pass rush guru, originally from New Orleans. And Mel Tucker, outside the box once again, aggressively goes down there, Taps him on the shoulder, makes the hire. Brandon Jordan, Michigan State's new defensive ends coach. Your thoughts, Ron Armstrong? I think, uh, first of all, I think it's a big time, big time hire. Uh, you touched on it outside the box a little bit. But I think from the from a football standpoint, man, if anytime you can get um, NFL guys, NFL level coaching into your program, you know, that's, that's obviously huge. Um, and just, you know, getting. You know, that next level, uh, you know, uh, fine-tuning technique and, you know, pro techniques and things like that um, to the college game, I think it's huge. And, and, and the fact that we have that every day, our kids, you know, they don't have to pay to head down to Houston and, and learn. You're, you're seeing that day in and day out. 
So I don't think it, it can be anything but a positive for for the you know for our DNs and and really anybody who's you know going to be rushing the passer, whether it's you know blitzing linebackers or or blitzing corners or you know um, I think it's just going to be a, a big time you know addition to the program. And also, um, we've seen it, it's already having an, an impact in football in the defensive end recruiting in terms of what some of these defensive ends are saying when they come and visit Michigan State. And Michigan State getting a commitment from a four star defensive end, Andrew DePape from Iowa, and others, five star from Tacoma, who's interested. Uh, going to be visiting probably this summer. Michigan State's going to crack his top five. It's it's recruits are aware of Brandon Jordan, and Michigan State has tried to recruit a defensive end over the years like everybody else does, but doing it with a little more juice now. And I think we're seeing that on the recruiting trail, and that's no surprise. Would you agree? Absolutely. Anytime you can get you know a guy that coached Von Miller, and you know you look on there and there's Chandler Jones and videos with him and. You know, Calais Campbell and who's who of, uh, of NFL pass rushers and DNs, you know, Rashawn Gary. I mean, it's, a, it's just a, the list goes on and on. The guys that that credit his teachings with, with you know, getting their getting their pass rush to the next level. I mean, that anytime you can say that's the guy's going to be coaching you for the next three, four years, you can't help but imagine that kids are going to want to want to be a part of that. So, again, I think it's huge moving forward. Like you said, you're already seeing just some of the the impact um, with, with BT being on the staff. You know, just look on the social media followings and mentions, and you know what kids are saying on their visits, and kids that are putting us on their list that you know that that probably may may have not been considering us before that we're now able to get in that living room and and you know and or at least you know get to have conversations. And that's where you want to start. You got to be able to you know get on the list to get the kids here. You got to at least be on the list. That's a start. So. I think it's you know it's definitely going to be a, a huge jolt to our recruiting efforts, you know. And 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 look, you want you want as many good football players in your program as possible. If you start seeing five star DNs considering your program, that becomes a you know next thing you know you got other guys that want to be a part of it because this five star kid is mentioned to you, and, you know. So it's I think it's a big step forward for us, and we, I can't wait to see what it looks like in the spring. We had a chance to get out on the field with these kids and, and you know get them, you know, moving in the right direction. All right, and Andrew Dupop or Dupape, uh, six five defensive end, number one thirty two in the country from Pleasant Valley, Iowa, committed to Michigan State yesterday. I think it was visited this past weekend. Uh, Jonathan Slack, offensive lineman, three star from Detroit King, committed to Michigan State. I'm planning to talk about those guys a little bit later here in the show. But your thoughts about those two commitments from Michigan State? You know, I think look, look you're getting a, you're getting a deep, you know a, a lineman you know early you get lineman early, um, and that, and that's something that that you like to see. I mean, I I'm of the opinion you can find you can find skill guys, but if you can get those big guys that that can move, and that you know games are you know we know this you know if you're watching you watch enough football you know the games are one up front, and for us to you know come out to shoot with you know a big time DN commitment and then an interior lineman commitment I think those are you know, those those are you know definite definite signs of that you know our program is healthy and moving in the right direction because uh you know that's where we're that's where we're going to have to be able to beat you know if we want to beat the Ohio States and the Georgias and you know some of those teams you got to be able to win up front so I'm excited you know to see that and you know, I'm sure you know Coach Tucker and staff are excited and we'll, and we'll see more of that I, I'm sure there's a there'll be a concerted effort you know the next. You know this this recruiting class to, to you know kind of beef up up front. Yeah, and Slack, a guy that Michigan State's been in on for a while, Detroit King guy. Uh, maybe not all the height that they usually get in the offensive line or, or what they want to get there uh, at about six four or so. But a burly guy, uh, Michigan State touching ground in Detroit, getting Slack and to Pape. I'll talk about him a little bit later. But six five, tall guy with some with some quickness and some ability to bend. And Michigan State going to the edge of the recruiting radius out to Iowa to bring that one in. And Michigan State had not been really mentioned with him a whole lot in previous weeks. But Brandon Jordan had something to do with enticing him to come to Michigan State. Uh, still waiting to hear about Michigan State's defensive tackles hire coach. It's been, you know, we've, we've hinted at it around the message board. And uh, people over at the bunker, they know who it's going to be. And now it's, it's being reported out there a little bit that uh, – expecting a Friday announcement for Marco Coleman. It's out there now. 
Um, Ron, you've known about it for, for a while. But anyway, Georgia Tech uh, Athletics Hall of Famer, played in the NFL 14 years. Uh, it won't be official, I don't think, until tomorrow. I don't know if you want to comment or not or not. But Coleman, defensive end, outside linebackers coach at Georgia Tech, 14 years in the NFL from 92 to 2005. I think he's originally from either Georgia or Florida. I've looked that up before, but I can't remember right now. Spent 2017 once he decided to go into coaching as a, fel- as a coaching fellow with the Philadelphia Eagles. Was also a defensive coordinator at Mandarin High School in Miami in 2017. 2018, Los Angeles, Las Vegas Raiders. I don't know where the Raiders were in 2018, but he was assistant D-line coach then. Then went back to his alma mater, Georgia Tech. 2019, 2020, 2021, Georgia Tech, outside linebackers, defensive ends coach. I know somebody who knows somebody that coached with him at Georgia Tech and speaks very highly of him, Ron. I don't know if you want to talk about that at all or you want to wait till next week or something. Well, yeah. It's assuming that, you know, the, the name that's out there, you know, becomes official. Um, I think, you know, if if you kind of, you know, pair his skill set with, you know, with his experience in, in interior linemen and, and NFL, you're, you're starting to see a trend here where we're getting NFL um, coaching and NFL level approach to defensive linemen. And, I mean, I, I, you know, I just said it before that you got to have, NFL quality lineman if you're going to want to win big in college football so you know assuming that that's the guy you know I, you know like it's, you know you've heard we've heard some you know, that name out there and some rumblings and and you know it's out there and I haven't heard anything to refute that so you know we're going to just operate the, under assumptions that's the accurate and I think we're getting a good coach and you know from folks I've talked to um you know he's he's a high energy you know he's a he, he knows uh you know the system. You know two gapping scheme that sort of thing. So I think we're you know we're gonna we're gonna be a pretty good up front. I mean I anticipate some improvement with our pass rush. I, you know some I anticipate um, a greater emphasis on on the type of kids we're recruiting. You know NFL body types. So this should be an exciting time for for Spartan football fans. All right. Now also uh, some of the news that happened. Um... In the last couple of days, Ma'a Nateote decided to come out of the portal and come back to Michigan State. Uh, your, your thoughts on that? Um, you know, when I ask you some things, you know, sometimes there's going to be times when you're going to have sourcing that you can't really divulge. So I apologize if I ask something that, uh, that, that might be, you know, outside baseball a little bit too much. Um, but uh, if you have any thoughts about Ma Nate Ote coming out of the portal and back in, presumably, to go through winter conditioning and to compete at the linebacker position heading into spring practice. I think I, you just said it. I think the fact that he's willing to come back and compete, you know, says it all. You know, I, and, and maybe, you know, freshmen, like we talked we talked before, you know, every freshman's homesick. Every freshman is miserable. You know, oftentimes it's the first time in your career that you're not playing or seeing it, you know, significant playing time. You know, um, the kids are far away from home. It's cold. It's not, you know, so, yeah, I'm sure there was some of that and, and, you know, probably overreacted to, to something or just, you know, just being a kid. And, and if, you know, I'm glad cooler heads have prevailed and he's going to come back and compete for a spot. But, you know, I mean, I, it, that's, you know, you don't, you don't want to see, freshman leave your program one semester in so you know it's for michigan state i think it's a you know good opportunity to have some more depth for a young fella you know he has an opportunity to come in and work his tail off in the winter and and you know throw his hat in the ring at you know in spring ball and see where where you know where he stacks up so you know competition is is you know you always want as much competition as in your program as possible and we've added some linebackers in the portal and you know, the fact that he's coming back just means another another you know talented linebacker in the room. All right, Ima Naitaote, four star coming in from the West Coast, was one of the linchpin members of the recruiting class last year. You know, just in terms of that, you don't want to see that guy give up before he's scratching the surface. If you're a Michigan State guy, um, I, you know, I mentioned this earlier in the show. I wonder if you've got any thoughts about this. You know, the rule is supposed to be if you if you transfer once, you can play immediately eligibility wise after that if you transfer a second time or a third time you're supposed to sit out a year i don't know if the ncaa is going to, going to stick to that rule i mentioned for example former usc quarterback jt daniels transferred from usc to georgia 
and now he's going to transfer again, presumably thinking he's going to be able to play right away somewhere. Now, in the past, they've had court cases where if you've got a reason that you have to return home because of a sick, sick family member or whatever, and a lot of that was trumped up. But I'm wondering if that had anything to do with Ma'ane Teote. If he leaves now, is he using his one immediate play transfer, or does that even come into their minds any, in, now? I mean, is that going to be... Uh, is that a rule that's going to be enforced or will we just see immediate eligibility all over the place every time? You, have you got any thoughts about that? Do you think that enters into it? And do you, do you think that's going nah, to be enforced? You know, Two part question. No, I don't think, I don't think he really considered um, the immediate eligibility part. Um, just, you know, just something it might've been a kind of a knee jerk reaction to enter the portal. But in terms of them enforcing, you know, the you got to sit out for a year. I think the NCA man is really trying to do their best to just kind of back off anything that seems like it's restrictive to players. They, you know, and I'm always going to be pro player and, and player freedoms and move about. So I think you're, you're seeing that the NCA man is really trying their hardest to just say, you know what, we're gonna we're gonna back off and just let this thing, let the coaches and the players and universities kind of sort this out like if you want to take bring in transfers bring them in like i I just it feels like they're they're really trying to get out of the you know enforcement of of player movement you know it doesn't it doesn't feel like it it, you know that they're really um cold guys to that you know we'll see once once we're kind of post-covid if they go back to that but it doesn't feel like that that's that's the case I can't recall anybody not being eligible, you know, in the last couple of years. Right. Just Joey Hauser and Jaden Reed. <laughs> Only Michigan State guys. I, mean, were, I think that was prior I think that was prior to COVID. Okay. Yes, yes it was. You know, but I I don't think I don't think since we've entered this COVID era anybody's been, you know, hasn't been allowed to play. Right. Right. All right, now and and and, and, and if you think about this if if you've gone two years, you know, coming on three years of allowing immediate eligibility, and you didn't blow up college football because of that, how then you how then do you go back to saying, well, you got to sit now? Mm-hmm. Like the game didn't really get, you know, harmed in allowing kids to play immediately. So how do you go back to saying, well, you know, now that this is over, you're going to go back to sitting a year? Explain to me what the what the logic behind that would be. Right. Right. Hey, thanks to Chris Martinez. Thank you, Chris Martinez, for your support. SpartanBack.com today with your personal sponsorship. We appreciate that for sure. Um, really do, Chris. Thanks a lot. Hey, Ron, also want to ask you about uh, Daniel Barker, tight end transfer. That's some news that's broken this week. Coming in, transferring in from Illinois, entered the portal. Thought about going pro. Uh, you know, Michigan State showed some interest in him and immediately got involved. And uh, good, solid, bona fide, proven Big Ten tight end that can catch it and run and ramble a little bit. Your thoughts about Daniel Barker, Illinois, coming to Michigan State for I winter conditioning? Gonna, I think I think I think we're going to look back, you know, some point next season and figure out that he might have been the steal of the port of the portal season for us because we haven't had a you know vertical tight end threat mm-hmm. you know since Josiah Price. Mm-hmm. So if you look if you look at our receivers you know, that we have coming back, getting a tight end kind of, I wouldn't say evens out losing Naylor, but it lessens, it can potentially lessen that impact if you have a guy that can work the middle, mm-hmm. you know, in between the, in between the hashes down the seams. Mm-hmm. Now you're, you're taking some of the pressure off of Reed and you're allowing some of these young guys to have time to get up to speed because he's going to come and he's played a lot of snaps. So, mm-hmm. He's, he should be a plug and play guy for you next year. So I think, I mean, I think, like I said, at some point next season, we're going to look back and say, you know what, that might have been the, the steal of the portal season for us. Mm-hmm. 18 catches last year for the Illini. For his career at Illinois, 64 receptions, 11 touchdowns, including a game winner against Michigan State back in 2019. 6'4, 235. Um, plug and play tight end, running all the routes you want your tight end to run. You mentioned that he can threaten the seam, get downfield a little bit, but also over the middle, the over routes in a crowd, yep. in the red zone, and tight Move end. Move the change, you know. Think. Yeah, tight end recruiting has been 
hit and miss for Michigan State, mostly miss for the last seven years, going back to the previous administration also. Um, I kind of expected more noise in the transfer portal at tight end two years ago. Last year, they got Malik Carr as a wide receiver and morphed him into a tight end, got on the field late in the year, made an impact. Looks like he's got a bright future. But now um, a lot of rubber meeting the road with Daniel Barker coming in with good size and pass, catch, pass catching ability. I've not looked at his blocking yet. I'm, I'm sure that it's solid. I'll have to go back and look at some full games. But his highlights in terms of being a pass catcher, impact guy, where impact is needed, especially with Michigan State. Tyler Hunt, it's my understanding, is, uh, you know, I asked some people a couple of weeks ago and they kind of thought he was coming back and I've not heard more about that since then. I've not seen any, you know, announcements and so forth. But if you don't know for sure with, uh, with Hunt, then that makes this one all the more important. And I've, I'm wondering across the country, as far as tight ends go, 6'4", 235, 64 career receptions. Is there any tight end in the country in the portal better than him? Or did Michigan State go out and get the best tight end in the portal for 2022? Yeah, I think I think that's a resounding yes. I think that, you know, going into it, um, you know, you never know what the season may look like. But as, as far as, you know, right now sitting here, like, yeah, I think we got the best tight end available out of the portal. And, you know, you expect that kid to come in and, and, and start and complete, you know, compete for playing time. You're not going to find that. I mean, look, there's there's very few freshmen like that you're going to run into, like no. the kid from Notre Dame or the kid from Georgia. Right. Those dudes, those dudes just don't show up all the time. Right. So you're not going to find that in a freshman recruit. So chances are you're going to have to hit the porter to find that. And I don't, I don't think there was another guy that had similar stats, you know, that was available to us. So, yeah, I think when you, when you, you break down the numbers and, and, and the type of production he's already had, bringing in, you know, coming into your program. I don't think we have a tight end on our roster with 64 catches. No. No. So, I mean, if you combine those guys, I don't think there's 64 no. catches there. So, exactly. so if you just start thinking about that standpoint, it's an immediate upgrade from what we have already on our, on our roster. So, yeah, it was a big time get in terms of, you know, what was out there and what, what our media needs are. And the excitement around it. I mean, if you're a Michigan State fan, uh, you know, with recruiting, sometimes they'll be f- chasing a guy for 8, 9, 10, 18 months trying to get somebody, and you know who the leaders are and who the visits are and who the finalists are. In the portal, you know, we're, we're aware that Michigan State's looking for an offensive lineman. We're aware of this and that. But a lot of times it kind of comes like a thief in, a, in the night, just quickly, overnight, boom. Well, you know, you, 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 and, that, and here's, here's the reason for that. I mean, there's a, and I, I had some conversations with some folks, and the book is out, man. That we're 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 one of the programs that do a really good job in the portal. So there are other programs, man, that are kind of watching, trying to you know get get some intel on who we may or may not be interested in it from the portal. So I think our staff is doing a really good job of just trying to you know kind of fly below the radar on some of these kids that we're looking to bring in mm-hmm. until we can get them on campus and you know kind of lock them down. Because it is it is well known that you know well documented that we do a good job of you know the way we set our portal you know kind of the NFL model free agency model um, if you will it's 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 out there so um, I I would anticipate that our staff would be even a bit more careful about you know letting it letting it out who we're interested in the portal just because I know there's some other programs that are you know, trying to you know they don't quite have the the you know, their setup isn't quite what ours is, so they're just kind of going to see, well, who are, who are they offering, who are they, and, and maybe try to, you know, kind of piggyback off of that. So you don't want to have to, you know, compete with 10 programs for a kid. If you don't have to, you can get them in and, you know, get them into full of your program before other folks are on it, on the, he's on their radar. And then Jarek Broussard, the running back coming in from Colorado, one of the best running backs in the portal. I mean, that's what uh, Kenneth Walker the third and the, and the, the great impact he had that helps Michigan State go out and get those guys. I and mean, we've talked before about how Michigan State, Mel Tucker said from day one when the, when the portal hit, he had one of his staff members eyeing the portal every 30 minutes to see who's going in, who's going in. And once, once names go in, they're evaluating to see if there's an interest or see what, what interest Michigan State might have. Michigan State's moving quickly when guys go in the portal. And because of that, when there are players that they are interested in, they're not having to recruit from behind. They're 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 recruiting right. from the from the front from the beginning on the I, I'm sure other programs will adapt and start doing that themselves. But the mean in the meantime, as Mel Tucker's getting his program established, 
they've utilized this portal. What about Bruce Arthur, the running back from Colorado? Over 300 yards rushing against Arizona two years ago when he was Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year. This year, slowed by injuries a little bit, but he wants to come and be Kenneth Walker 2.0 a little bit. Your thoughts about Bruce Arthur coming in from Colorado? Again, another guy that you expect to come in and, and, and be a plug and play, you know, uh, you, you know, and and if you can you can get a starter, you know, from the portal, um, I think especially a starter that you know you you said was a uh, Pac-10 Player of the Year. Look, look, let's just let's just back him for a second. I don't think anybody expects him to come to come in and be K nine. Right. Right. I mean, we didn't we didn't know what to expect no. from K nine, but yeah. if you can get a guy to come in be a solid Big Ten starter, running back, running back, plus player. Again, you weren't necessarily going to get that in a freshman recruit. I mean, those, you know, you're not getting Adrian Peterson. Those dudes just don't come around that often as a freshman running back. Then you look at the running back room, you're like, okay, who do we have that that you figure the other t- other teams will have the game plan for? It's not to disparage any of our, our running backs. It's just simply say, when you're going through a game plan, you're like, okay, Kenneth Walker's not there anymore. We're not going to adjust our defense to, you know, whomever else is in that running back room. So that means you got to go out and you got to try to upgrade the room. And I think this kid's an upgrade in the room. You add the other uh, the Berger, Ber- you know, Jalen Berger, whatever, you know, kid from Wisconsin. Yeah. And now you look and you're like, okay, so there's some, there's been an upgrade in talent in the room. And, you know, we'll see. You know, I, I think, I think he's a good player. Um, the only thing I looked on film is I'm not sure about the top end speed. Right. You know, if, if he has home run speed. I agree. Um, but but he, but but in but there's there's some there's some talent there. Sure. Like in one of the things I do like about him in, in tight spaces, the kid finds cracks. Yes. So if you're if you're if you're looking at okay, what's our offensive lines issue? We're not we're not a, 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 a today. You know, we're just kind of looking at the offensive line. We're, it wasn't a group that would go out there and overpower people. So the running backs are going to have to find daylight. You know, Kenneth Walker was great at breaking tackles. This guy is great at finding little cracks and squeeze, you know, and, and squeezing through. So that is something that you can you can look at. Say, okay, well, we, we may have something here that that we can use. And also, he looked comfortable catching the ball out of the backfield. Yes. Yeah. So now you could put him in the screen game, and you have something else. So if you can get, you know, it doesn't have to be eighteen hundred yards you know, handing the ball to him. But if we can get 1,800 yards or 1,500 yards with, you know, rushing and receiving, that's – now you now you're looking at you added, you know, 15 to 1,200 yards from your running back. You got a tight end that can stretch the field and get six 700 yards down the middle of the field, 500, whatever it is. Now you're starting to see where this offense is taking shape. And you still haven't talked about Jaden Reed. And you haven't talked about Mosley and some of these other kids that are coming back. And you look at that offense and say, okay, we may have a – we may have something here. Mm-hmm. So it's the pieces and where they fit with what's already here. And you start looking at the whole unit and all of a sudden, if we get that offensive line, you know, those guys healthy and, and, and sure that up, you're looking around like, man, this offense could look, could, could, you know, this offense could look as, as good or not, you know, pretty much the same or if not better than it did last year, you lost Kenneth Walker and Jalen Naylor. You're like, well, that doesn't sound like it could be possible, but then you start looking around at the pieces you've added with what's coming back and that quarterback having another year in the system. And all of a sudden, you know, kind of exciting. Very exciting for Michigan State fans. Coming off that Peach Bowl victory, you, you look ahead to 2022, and there's question marks every year in college football. But here's Michigan State going out and hitting a couple home runs in the portal at running back and tight end. Very exciting. Let me ask you also about, uh, before I let you go, the recruiting weekend uh, for the weekend of the Michigan basketball game. A lot of four-stars on campus a couple of those have committed one one is committed already and Michigan State running strongly with some of the others uh, what did you hear ear to the ground inside the program about how that recruiting weekend went with Mel Tucker and his you know, staff I, I I heard that it was um about as well run of uh, you know everything was coordinated like just knocked it out the park from you know from just I heard that you know, there was a lot of excitement in the way that thing unfolded and, and, and the way the weekend went and the way it was set up, you know, from, from just hearing, hearing a couple of kids, you know, you know, some back channel conversations. And yeah, I thought just put it this way, moving forward, our recruiting should, should improve drastically. Just the, some, some of the stuff that 
but I, I, you know, I'm not privy to, you know, I can't, I don't want to be the half secret. So that's not what I'm, what I'm trying to do. I just mm-hmm. got to be careful with what I say, but it was, it was a great weekend for Michigan state football. And, and don't be surprised to see more of that stuff coming, you know, with, with recruits leaving here and recruits, parents leaving here blown away by, you know, what's already in place and what's coming. Mm-hmm. And how well organized it was and how they reached out and got talent on campus and the show that they put on and the electric atmosphere of Michigan State University and, and Mel Tucker, you know, celebrating that basketball game. I mean, it was turned up to a volume 10 and it's not a one time deal. If you're recruiting against Michigan no. State, um, if you're recruiting against Michigan State, you've got you've got a match on your hands these days. It's interesting. If you're a Michigan State fan, you know right a now. good a good buddy of mine who who is uh, affiliated with another program told me that that what's happening up here is something that they always want always worried about. Once if we ever got the right guy in here, so everything was there already there to be, you know, one of the top dogs. We just never fully embraced everything that Michigan State could be. It's like Mel Tucker's not even embraced everything that Michigan State is. He's pushing for more, and it's showing up in everything. Sure. Ron, I've got three coaches or three questions about the Jim Harbaugh situation. Don out in DeWitt says, Jim, uh, please give us, give us your take on Captain Khaki's excellent clown show from the People's Republic of Ann Arbor. And Jeff P. from Parts Unknown says, how devastating to Michigan is the Harbaugh f- fiasco? And Sola from Westland, Michigan says, What's your, what are your thoughts on the Michigan situation? My thoughts would be, and I've posted a little bit about this, but um, with some sourcing that I've done, and, and the source, meantime, is told me that uh, Courtney Cronin from ESPN, he said she has it right on the money with with her thoughts on things. And what Courtney tweeted yesterday is this. She said, my read on the Harbaugh Viking situation in speaking with sources, Harbaugh was in the mix for the Minnesota job because of his connection to Adafo Mensa. He operated under the assumption that the job was his and prepared for the interview as such. The Vikings saw this very differently and not as a slam dunk. As a source put it to me, the way they felt uh, Harbaugh viewed the situation coming into Wednesday was a slam dunk. There was no offer extended. This is not necessarily a matter of who said no to whom, but two sides that did not align with their viewpoints on things. So my source says that Courtney is right on the money with, with that. So not trying to pour any more drama on it, but Harbaugh, according to Courtney, and my sources say that she she has, has the ear to the ground real well on these things, the simple case of Harbaugh thinking it was going to be his job and the Vikings weren't actually all that interested. And I'd been hearing all along that really no NFL teams were all that interested. But Harbaugh made it known six or seven weeks ago that he was interested in leaving and he went out and walked a plank and then he's got to come and walk the plank back into the ship in Ann Arbor. I, I don't know if you want to expand on it too much. I'm just curious. Th- those are questions that people ask me. I've given my two, two cents on it. You have anything to add on that? Yeah, you know, there's a there's a... I remember there was a, uh, before we hired D'Antonio, you know, gosh, you know, 06 or whatever it was, there was a guy that was coaching that came in for an interview and sort of had that same attitude that, you know, the job was his and that, he, you know, we were kind of, he was kind of doing us a favor taking the job and ultimately he never got the job. And, you know, and I'm, I, and it just kind of reminded me of that, like showing up with, like, this is a formality, I already have the job can kind of come off like a jerk and rub people the wrong way and probably becomes a situation where you don't get the job. You know, that might be part of it. But the second part of this is what now for your program? And having been a player on a team where the coach, you thought the coach was leaving and then the coach ultimately decided to come back, you lose a little bit of that. I mean, you lose a little like, man, oh, man, coach. Like, it, there's a little bit that that you lose with, with – when the coach does that, but Perlis, now, Perlis, people, man, Perlis, Perlis didn't. He, Perlis turned down the NFL, not the other way around. Yeah, but but we we thought he was gone. You know, it was you know we we yeah. went to bed thinking that you know we're going to have a team meeting the next day and coach is going to be gone. Ultimately, what happened is we you know he changed his mind in the middle of the night and he was at the team meeting. So, but but the point I'm getting at is young people, man. They, I don't think I, folks like well. How, I, from from my standpoint, when I'm like, how can he go back? It's not the kids I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? It's not like his players are gonna be like, well, coach he was trying to leave us. I don't think kids really care, man. Like after after, you know, he's gonna go to the team meeting, he's gonna say what he says, and it's gonna be business as usual. 
those aren't the folks I'm talking about. It's the people that are at the cocktail parties and the alumni functions, those kind of things that you got to face when you're, when everybody in the, in the country knows you were trying to leave and now you got to come back and pretend like this is where you wanted to be all along. How does that work? How does it work if they don't, you know, I mean, maybe the schedule is kind of in his favor next year. Mm-hmm. So they should have a you know decent record, but how does it work, man? If they go out there and get annihilated by Ohio state, how does it work when we go down there and beat them again for the third straight year? Then, then how, See what I mean? Like mm-hmm. what you're doing is you're putting yourself on a hot seat on something that you had a ton of momentum coming off the, the you know, for the first time. And since you've been there, everything mm-hmm. was pointing in the right direction for you. And for a program who lives to win the off season, mm-hmm. all you've done is lost the off season. Yeah. So whatever goodwill you had by winning the big 10, by beating Ohio state, I mean, you gave it all back. So, I don't know how. I don't know how. And then you 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 hear rumblings about the AD. And all I can tell you is this: I played on a team where the head coach and the AD didn't get along, and everybody knew it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Everybody knew it. It was, you know, it was all. And whenever the AD was around, or I mean, uh, you know, the coach and the president didn't get along. Mm-hmm. So my point is, whenever there's admin issues and, and coaching issues, everybody knows, and it and it weighs on the team, and it weighs on the program, and and, and I don't know how you fix that, especially when everybody knows it's out there. Like, how do you fix that? You can go to a press conference and you can say whatever you want to say. Nobody's going to believe it. So, and I don't know who who will be his port in the storm should anything start to go wrong there. Like, they better win. Like, he better win games. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know how else you get past that. You know, when when everybody knew you were trying to get out of there and, and they didn't do a ton to try to keep you. Hmm. Hmm. It's interesting. And, and this season that they had a great season, but they really, as a fan base, really didn't allow themselves to enjoy it. They, they enjoyed it from a fallout shelter most of the year, even when they were five and oh six and don't get ready to play Michigan state. Then they lost that one. And that was just, uh, they, they freaked out about that. And then they went on a winning streak and beat Ohio state. It wasn't until like the last five minutes of the Ohio state game that I sensed the Michigan fans came out of the fallout shelter and were like, Hey, look at us. We're great. Usually they spend well, all of June and July and August talking about how they're great when they're zero and zero. Then they go three and oh, and then September Heisman. And they think they're great. They did not strut all season until they beat Ohio state. And then they beat Iowa. They had about, you know, four good weeks in the sunshine and then Georgia, you know, bombed them back down to reality. And then this, so usually when they go to, you know, they win a big 10, we hadn't been since 2004 or whatever. Usually it's there. It's an insufferable situation, right? Hyperbole, advanced credit all over the place. This time was different. It's ironic that, that, uh, that they didn't get to strut as much this year. And like you said, they've lost that momentum. So now next year, the schedule is is embarrassingly weak. Colorado State, Hawaii, and UConn are their three non-conference games. Then Maryland, their first real game is at Iowa, October 1st. Iowa runs hot and cold. They just destroyed Iowa in the Big Ten Championship game. They better win that game. They go at Indiana, which is not easy these days, and then Penn State at home. You know, they win those games, but still no one's going to give them credit in their own fan base, I don't think, which is a lot to say for them. I don't think they'll get any credit until Michigan State visits. They'll they'll have a bye week to get ready for that. Uh, Once again, Halloween weekend. So, you know, until Halloween, he can't prove anything because there's nothing on the board, on the schedule to, to get much done even with Penn State coming to visit. But they better not trip up with any of those. You know, I, I think I actually think there's going to be some folks who, you know, that, that'll do everything they can to, you know, to show, you know, he, he came back and there he, he's got them right back in the playoff hunt. You know, listen, they're always going to be media darlings. They, they have a big-time media influence. So if they come out to shoot 6-0 and or whatever, there's going to be folks that'll say, you know, he made the right decision coming back to Michigan. There'll be articles written about how he spurned NFL interest and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, you know and I know there's there's two games on that schedule that the that the folks down there that he has to win. And he doesn't have a whole lot of uh you know he doesn't have a whole lot of goodwill right. with you know, he can't go down there and lose to Michigan State, lose us for a third straight year. You know, he just can't do it. I mean, I, I don't know how he survives. If he, you know, we we beat him and Ohio State beats him, I don't know how. I don't know how you can continue 
especially when when we it's out there that the AD that you know him he and the AD aren't on good terms or whatever the case may be. But mm-hmm. you know, I'll tell you what, you know, that's their problem, and I, I'm I'm glad. Like, look, I don't I don't know how he comes back, but for once, I'm glad it's not us that are <laughs> that it's not our our program, and you know that we have everything pointing in the right direction because. I know how distract how you know disruptive that can be to to your, to your program, your team. With you know when the coach is going one direction and the AD and admins going the other direction. Mm-hmm. Sure is fascinating. In the, in the meantime, Michigan State, you know they start off with Western Michigan. That's going to be tough. I mean they've been a bowl team. That's a competitive game quite often. Then Akron, then at Washington. I know Washington's going through a uh, transformation. But anytime you go out to the West Coast. It's a difficult challenge going out to Wisconsin, going out to Washington and Seattle. That's going to be interesting and fun in a lot of ways. And then Minnesota coming off another good year. They come in for Michigan State's Big Ten home opener September 24th. That's a big one. At Maryland is not easy anymore. And then Ohio State comes to visit. That's going to be a hassle. And then Wisconsin Badgers coming to East Lansing. So Michigan State's crossovers in the first half of the season. The other side of the Big Ten. Minnesota and Wisconsin not necessarily juggernauts but they will test you so Michigan State as good as they were this year got to get right back to work for the woodshed to get it working but it's uh, we got a lot of time before we get to next summer and into the the preseason but it's always football season there's always football news and Ron big movie Armstrong we certainly enjoy talking Michigan State football with you my friend for sure. Hey, thanks for having me on, Kyle. Any, it's, it's certainly great to have you. Ron, you, you, you do well. I'll probably talk to you soon. Be good. And uh, if I don't talk to you, have a great weekend, but I'll be talking to you soon. Take care, okay? All right, man. Go green. There he goes. Ron Armstrong. All right, so guys, listen. This is what's going on. Um, you might remember about a month or so ago, uh, I had to all of a sudden unplug uh, unplug the everything and shut down because the battery was not charging. So then I took the, the laptop in to get looked at and had a battery replaced they had to do it off site took about a week and a half two weeks to get that done and i was all excited about it because i got my laptop back that's why we're back uh, in in this in these environs but i'm right back to having problems with the battery i'm down to four percent we're going to keep rolling it doesn't look like it's it's uh losing juice that rapidly but we're right back where we were a couple of weeks ago and i'm not very excited i'm not very happy about that so if I'll be keeping an eye on that number, if it gets down to 1%, I'll have to quickly unplug and evacuate. But in the meantime, let's go through some of these comments and reactions. So we got a call. Let's see. Call from Jolton Joe. All right. To accept, press one. To send a voicemail, press two. All right, Jolton Joe out in Dearborn, Michigan. Are you going to be nice on the Spartan Mag Live tonight, Jolton Joe? Of course. <laughs> All right. Is this the Jolton Joe from Dearborn, Michigan? It is. Holy I'm mackerel. Listening. What, who, do I got comp? This is Comp Roni. You are on the air, my friend. How are you? Okay, well, I'm not, let me turn it down then. Okay, hold All on. Right. All right, I got it down. You know, Conan Dyke, Co- Co- I'm on mine, you're still talking. Yeah, you're, you got about a 45-second delay there. So go ahead and gotcha, turn that off. Gotcha. Uh, but, you know, Conan Dyke and I have always talked about coming down there to your establishment and, and, uh, and saying hello down, down there in, uh, in Dearborn. We've not, we've, not, we've not pulled that off, but it's great to talk to you uh, person to person right now. Yeah, you know, I've uh, been meaning to call my insurance. I sold the bar. Okay. Uh, about in August, so I'm out of it. But, you know, ironically, my bar was right across the street from Danny Enos's brother. Right. I remember and he's you saying a good that. Friend. He's a good guy. He's a great guy, Gary Enos. And uh, uh, and I, you know, through the years, Shara, not Gary Shara, I know him. I know Brez, uh, Brez Prez. Through the years, I know some of the guys uh, uh, on Spartan Mag, you know. But I'm barred now, so I can't. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Joel and Joe, Joel and Joe. He is barred from SpartanMag.com underground bunker because he he was challenging too many people to cage matches. Yeah, I know. Well, them days are. <laughs> yeah, them days are long over. You know, I mean, but, uh, I, you yeah, know, it, a, it, you know, being a, being a moderator at SpartanMag.com underground bunker. Sometimes it's like being a recess attendant, or it's it's like oh, it's, course, as you, you know. would know, it's like it's kind of like owning a bar too. Sometimes you have to escort your friends out of the oh, establishment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've been a bar my whole life, and it's yeah, you're like romp room. You're right. And maybe this is my outlet. I don't know. Good. But, <laughs> Good. You know, you got to watch what you say. You know, your business is business. But uh, yeah, the only thing that gets me about the guys and some of the guys on Spartan Mag is that uh, they denigrate the school. 
You yeah. know, I mean, why are you cutting Michigan State down? Well, yeah. you know, what are you doing? You know, that's my opinion. That's where I get into trouble with some of these guys. You are very consistent. You, know? you are very consistent in defending the honor of Michigan State University, Joe. That is your MO, no question about it. Many times taking yours truly to task and telling me, Comperoni, what are you talking about? You're not giving State enough credit. Yeah, what are you? Yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've got to throw you an uh, email once in a while. It's fine. You know, I, it's ironically, I didn't go there. Uh, you know, in my family, my dad was deceased, and my brother, a big U of M guy, so I've been arguing with them guys for all my life, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the old time was the guys that are 90, 95 years old, that kind of thing. Them guys are all U of M guys, you know, because Michigan State didn't come around really to the Big Ten until about 50, right? 1950, something like that. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so I've been arguing with, I've been arguing with everybody. <laughs> you know, down here, uh, you know, Dearborn, where I went to Forbes, and uh, they got some Michigan State people out of there. Mm-hmm. You know, like my class. Uh, well, my quarterback went to Purdue, but the guy in front of me uh, it was a guy, Robert Sala, is that, that coach's uh, nephew, uh, uncle. Okay. Okay. Uh, he passed away. He was a Michigan State uh, uh, scholarship player back in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. And uh, Mike Iconella. Yeah, sure. another guy from Forts. Uh, yeah, Brian Masala. Brian Masala's a good friend of mine. Okay. Uh, you, you know, I used to know, I know Brian, you know, these guys are younger than me. Mike Quinella was my son's gym coach in Livonia. Believe that. Mm. And then he left the teaching thing and he got back with his uh, family into the construction business, I believe. But Brian, I met him when, this was, I met Brian before I got my first bar. And it was, I was working at the Fairlane Club in Dearborn, like a private club, uh, athletic type club. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's why I met him. You know, because again, these guys are younger. They're 20 years younger than I am. And uh, we became friends from there, you know. And he's still a pretty good friend. He's a good guy. You see these guys on the board rip them. It's best I not say nothing bad, man. You know, they, you know, uh, he's, he is what he is. Good guy. You know, and he's got Michigan State's uh, interests at heart. Mm-hmm. You know, and the same thing where they're ripping Dan Enos. I know Dan Enos since he was in high school. Mm. You know, uh, he's another, he's an Ethel Ford. I'm a, Brian and I are forcing guys. These guys, uh, the Enoses are from Ethel Ford, but you know, when it comes to Dearborn, it's, it's all cool. And, uh, uh, Danny's a good guy. You know, I mean, like I said, I see these guys on the board ripping them, you know, I don't know. So maybe it's best I don't comment. Right, bro. <laughs> whatever you think, whatever you think, uh, you, you've earned it. So whatever you think, but Musalem, I you mean, know, hey, I know, I know Musalem really well too. He gets a kick out of everybody ripping on him here and there, but there's a lot of people that support him too. And I like, I like Brian. Well, like I say, he, uh, you know, Brian, uh, uh, yeah, he, he's all in, you know, I don't know how we got with this be on them guys. I mean, <laughs> good for him, you know, uh, that he's right in with them guys. He's, uh, I think Brian is, a, he's in a financial business. You know, he uh, he does a lot of financial stuff uh, is what his job is. But, uh, you know, he's in with these guys, and, he, and he's a good guy. He's doing a good job for Michigan State. You know, I was, you know, that one guy, uh, you know, I, I found out who he was, too, that Michigan State University guy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, you know, don't try to out Brian Masalem. When Brian Masalem was in the room when Tucker signed the extension, you know, don't try to say you were there when you weren't. You know, Brian was the one in the room. And facilitated that thing with uh, Ishbia. You know, I I don't talk to Brian too much. Only you know once a couple three whatever. Uh, I think he's busy. Uh, you know, I'm not going to bug him. You know, once a week about Michigan State. But before Ishbia deal came down, he told me I talked to him just on the phone, gabbing a little bit. He said that I could, the, the, uh, something's coming down where Michigan State fans are going to do are going to be gr- very happy, so on and so forth. Well. I kind of forgot about it. I, and then I texted him. I said, hey, what's going on? He goes, patience, grasshopper, or something like that, you know. And sure enough, he, and he's the one that set the Ishbia deal up. You know, he was the one that he brought on stage. And these other guys, you know, they're saying, no, but, well, we've all seen it. So, and I'm not here to defend Brian. He doesn't need me to defend him. But, uh, you know, as fourth and guys got to stick together, two count. All right, I hear you. Know? Jolton Joe. So what's on yeah. your mind with Michigan State football, basketball, and what's going on with the Spartans this particular week? Nothing. Well, you know, I think we're in a, in a golden age of Michigan State because, you know, you got Izzo, who they should put a monument up. They should put a monument up of Coach D'Antonio. And, and Tucker's doing a great job. I think everything is uh, – 
But you know, the people that kind of dog out Coach D a little bit don't realize that that Coach Tucker has a lot of money now. Yeah. You know, they can afford them extra assistance and yes. recruiting guys yes. and uh, interns and all that stuff. Yes. Coach D didn't have that. That's right. You know, and not everybody knows that. You know, and, no, and, not, and, and everybody and everybody knows that I love Mark D'Antonio and I've got great respect for the impact he had at Michigan State. Great coach. I've compared him to Aaron Parsegian. Yeah. I think he's outstanding. I'm not sure, you know, in this in this age of analysts and expanded staffs, would D'Antonio have gone that direction or did he really, you know, aggressively pursue to have that on his staff or was he set with the way he wanted to do it? Now, I know that D'Antonio went out and raised a lot of money that helped Tucker's first year. You know, D'Antonio went out, it's my understanding, went out and really helped with fundraising that first off season when Luana Simon was gone and Mark Hollis was gone. So they were a couple of big, you know, big help, big helps in fundraising, especially Mark Hollis, yeah. of course. So D'Antonio had to take on a lot of that for himself and he raised a lot of that money. And then he retired. That money went to help uh, Tucker, as it turned out, with some of his uh, initial expansion of the staff would d'antonio have gone in that direction i don't know things are changing rapidly in, in the landscape of college football but with the with the changes that ha that have come about you know with with expanded staffs and transfer portal name image and likeness um I, you know i'm not i'm i suspect that d'antonio would have taken more of a kirk ferentz approach to it you know it's more of a of a bystander, whereas Tucker coming in at that particular time during those changes was a it's a great personality and a great visionary to take that baton at that point and and run with it. And Mel Tucker, you know, on the field he's had a couple of seasons, and you know you got to win football games later, and that's going to be difficult. But the off season, day to day roster management promotion of the program all those things day after day after day he just keeps getting base hits base hits base hits mel tucker every day yeah and home runs as well and some home uh, runs. i think we got lucky with him you know uh in fact i uh found out the date i think they announced tucker on a sunday and 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 gary enos and i have remained friends all these years even though i we, we were kind of like competitors for for about three four years but he's a great guy and I, uh, he told me the Saturday of, he goes, Michigan State hired Mel Tucker, you know, after the fickle thing blew up. You know, and I asked Gary, I said, you know, because you know, his brother was at Cincinnati. I said, ask, you know, what, what happened with that fickle? And he never got back with me. He said something, the one couple times I asked him, he said, you know, too big a rebuild. And I didn't press it, so I don't know what, what, what really went down there. Uh, but Coach D has did a lot with less. Oh, of course. You know, I mean, and, uh, like I said, you give him the same resources. He's got, yeah, to me, he's, you know, I grew up uh, when Michigan State was great, you know. But Duffy, I was never that. Coach D is the best coach you've had at Michigan State in my lifetime. You know, I said, now Mel Tucker might, you know, eclipse that. We'll see. I mean, Saban was Saban for the five years. But, uh, you know, Duffy, I, you know, after Duffy won big in the 60s, he, he kind of, let me tell you about Duffy's teams. In the early 70s. The McClary, Bobby McClary, the McClary brothers are friends of mine, especially Terry. Terry passed on, but and so did Bob, actually. But uh, Bobby McClary was on a team in the early 70s at Michigan State that 10 guys got drafted, and they were 5-5. Five and five. Yeah. Okay, the whole line. Was that when the so Saul I'm brothers really were there? That, uh, who? The Saul brothers and Billy Joe Dupree, was it around that time? I think the Saul brothers, yeah, Bill Simpson was there, but Van yeah. Pelt was on that team. Delama Lewis. And, uh, and, yeah, and 10 guys got drafted. They were five and five. Oof. You know, and then, but what happened, I think, with Duffy is he lost a lot of his assistants. Yeah. He lost Danny Boyce here, uh, and he lost Perlis. And, well, Perlis really came in after the great teams. But he lost uh, Yeoman, that guy. He went to Houston. Bill he Yeoman. lost a lot of guys. Hank, Hank Bulla. You know, I think Wayne Fonts. Wayne Fonts. Hank Bulla went to the pros, right? Chuck and, Fair. Uh, was Chuck Fairbanks on his staff? I think Fairbanks was there, but I don't think he was there for them 65, 66 teams. I don't think. Bulla was king of them teams. You know, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, I, 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 I hooked up with George Perlis's crowd. Yeah. You know, them guys are a lot older than me, but I was bartending at this bar. Uh, in Dearborn, and, and uh, anyway, somehow I hooked up with uh, George's Burner Highway friend. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were great guys. Now, a lot of them guys have passed on, but for, and for all through the 80s until George got let go, I went to I went every Saturday with that. I was part of that crowd. 
And uh, what was that crowd like? What, what was what was Perlis's? What were his home guys? Well, Perlis's Perlis home home crew. Well, Perlis's home crew down there guys. in Verner, Verner, Detroit. What were the, what was well, what were those guys like? They were great guys. They were you know like he said, salt of the earth, and and they were a lot of fun. I remember them guys. I'm in between them and like. Enos and you know, I mean, he, them guys are about fifteen years older than I was. But, those guys, uh, those guys grew up in Detroit in the fifties. Oh, Burner Highway. You know, they they all went to Holy Redeemer. Perlis didn't, but the, the great majority of them guys went to Holy Redeemer. And at, in the early fifties, Holy Redeemer was the biggest Catholic parish in the country. Okay, and uh, it was that uh, lower uh, income uh, Irish at the time and all that and. Uh, <laughs> And what them guys did, Perlis included, there was about, you know, I don't know, early 50s or whatever it was. They all enlisted, you know, 20 of them enlisted in the Army. Mm-hmm. You know, front page of the news and all that kind of stuff. So that's a, And then George came out of there, and uh, I think he went to Hawaii to play sports or something. I think Duffy caught up to him over there. So, you, know, you know, here's a little known fact. Perlis actually went to the University of Tennessee originally. Oh, I didn't know that. I've never heard so, that. Yeah, he didn't. Yeah, yeah, he didn't. He didn't last too long, you know. Back then, you know, there was, uh, you know, George coming from up here. I don't know what happened. All I know is he went there. He didn't last in a couple months and came back. Yeah, it's a little known thing. Hmm. But George went down there. But uh, you know, he he was. A, people take shots at him too, and he was really a down to earth guy. You know, oh, yeah. he, uh, oh, yeah. you know, Perlis. Uh, you know, every bar. He was at that bar, the sports haven, where I been, and then. He was at my bar on Ford Road, where Gary, uh, where to Sharon Austin, he was there, and uh, uh, Romero was there, uh, Brez Prez was there, and uh, he, you know, he, I mean, I, and I, you know, I've been in his house. I used to hang around with them guys, you know. I mean, he, I didn't go because of me. I went with them. And what he did was every uh, summer they'd have that high school all star game and uh, they played at, at Michigan State and all the guys would go up to golf. They're, they're, you know, they play softball on this field. Okay. Now we're talking 80, 45. Them guys are still pretty, you know, about 50 or whatever they right, were. Right. And uh, he was he was pretty good. He played, he was the pitcher. Nick Saban was the best player. He was a shortstop. Okay. And he was good too because Saban's about my age. He was a lot younger than them guys. Yeah. And, uh, and then after we'd go to George's house, uh, you know, about three or four in the afternoon after the game, we'd go to them guys golfed and did whatever. And they came back to his house and uh, he lived on copper hearth or copper something or other nice home. And I, then he moved over by Lancet country club, but uh, it was a lot of fun. And George was a great host, very down to earth. Uh, when he was with his guys, he was all burn a highway too. You know, <laughs> you know, I mean, he's not having dinner with the president of school when he's with us, you know. Right, right. And that's short. He's a good guy. He was a good guy. Yeah. No, uh, I mean, I I thought he kind of screwed up a little bit at the end. You know, I don't know. That was my. But I would never say nothing to them guys because they were all on it. They were 100 percent behind George. Yeah, it's it's hard and, to keep. Uh, it's hard to keep it rolling. It's hard to build it, and then it's hard to keep it rolling. And I didn't really understand well, that. Was, I was at, I was at the state news in 1988 when Michigan State played Georgia in the Gator Bowl, and Vince Dooley was head coach of Georgia, and he was retiring. That was yeah. Vince Dooley's last game. And I remember George Perlis saying, yeah, I've got a lot of respect for Vince Dooley being there at Georgia and keeping people happy there for 20 years. And, I mean, you know, my 19-year-old self was like, what do you mean keeping people happy? How hard can that be? But now yeah. looking back yeah. at it, that's especially in a place like Georgia, how I mean, the expectations are different at Georgia now than they were then. But there, there was always high and difficult expectations. But what George was saying is what eventually got him. It's hard to keep people happy. Now, George... Perlis used to go yeah. out. He, George did not shy away from a confrontation. You know, sometimes people will let sleeping dogs lie a little bit, but Perlis, you know, he kind of, that made him feel alive to, to uh, go sumo with some people once in a while. Well, you know what got him in big trouble with Joe Fall? Joe Fall was a terrible man. He was, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't judge him. He was a big U of M guy. And, and you know, remember papers, there was none of you guys weren't around yet. You know, there was no media and Joe Falls had a lot of influence. Well, what happened was they were, I think, at the hula ball. And remember Dave died, the, the sportscaster? Uh-huh. Or the writer for the news. He was a writer yeah. for the news. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he was a Michigan State beat writer, if I recall. Well, he was writing something about Blake Ezor. Uh, you know, when George, we're gonna, he got a DUI or something, you know, bad. You know, George he wanted to play him in this game, right, in the hula ball. And, uh, hey, George, when you're going to, you're going to suspend him, you're going to do this and do that. Well, George had a, you know, he had a hot temper. I don't know how well you know, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
he goes in. Now, he hold said on, something hold. very disparaging. Yeah, we we don't need to go into specifics about that one. But yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He, 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 he fired back. He fired back at Dave Dye, and yeah, that was he fired back pretty strong and and uh, pretty disparaging. And he uh, and so they came after him with all guns, all them writers, Fred Gerard, all them guys came after George. And um, you know that was kind of basically his fault. He didn't have to say what he said. You I know? was I was there and, when uh, when Dave asked the question too. Uh, I think I was oh, there you for were that there, one. Were you? I think I was there for that one. Um, but. And, but but anyway, yeah, we don't need to go into yeah. specifics on that. But I didn't, no, I, I didn't, uh, yeah, I, I didn't know at that time that that was, I I I didn't. I thought that if that was the time, I, I thought that George was overly defensive on that particular question. There were other times when people did come at him, but on that one, I don't think. I think that he thought that he was being attacked when really he kind of wasn't. I think it was just a regular news yeah, question. Yeah, if, if I remember the question, it was about that DUI, you know, whatever. It was, it was, it was fair. You know, some, sometimes, you know, writers, back in the old days especially, would try to get, would try to needle and get under the skin of coaches. But I didn't think that Dave was in that, that particular instance. But anyway, we don't need specifics right. on that. But, oh, those were no, some course, those were not, interesting times. And back then, you know, nowadays there's video of every press conference and, the, you know, the, the big, the, right. you know, the, the astute, you know, the diehard fans can go watch it themselves. But back then, you didn't have access to the press conferences. You might see 20 seconds oh, on the local news. But other than that, you would have to wait for quotes from articles in the Lansing State Journal, Detroit News, Detroit Free Press, Grand Rapids Press, for coverage from the press conferences. Every single word that the coach said did not necessarily get to the ears of the fan base. It had to go through that prism of the writers. Writers had a lot of power back right. then. Writers, in a lot of ways, still do have some, but not, not like they did then. Now the big... Needle, well, now the big needle mover is, is social media. It's fans on Twitter. That's, oh, that's and and that's that's kind of worse than just sports writers. Can you, imagine, can you imagine? Hey, can you imagine George on social? Too? Oh my God! <laughs> if Perlis was around today, uh, the, you know they say I, like you, you're looking that. at the basketball coaches that have quit, like Chris Mack at Louisville and Turgeon at yeah. Maryland. Social media and Twitter has a lot to do with that. His family and himself just got tired of just the hailstorm of social media attacks. That that's a part of it these days. Well, sure. We'll look at Coach D and Coach Izzo uh, with the the uh, mass star thing. Well, they have to do with it. Nothing. You know why are you going after them guys? Yeah. You know, and it was you know, and and uh, you know, I know that you know. Get back to your bold. Shemlecker and George are pretty good buddies, as as well as you could be. You know, in that position, you know, they grew up together. They were, uh, you know, pretty much the same age. I think, I think Bo was a little bit older, George. And, uh, and, but, you know, could you imagine Bo with social media? Oh no. my God. No. You know, and, but you know, what do you, better yet, what do you hate? Mm. But, uh, you know, you, I guess you learn to adjust, you know, and that's the way it goes. You know, Coach jinso has been, and Coach Antonio, they were from the old days too. You know, you just, I guess, learn to adjust, but it's tough on them guys, man. Mm hmm. You know. right, man. Hey, Joe, and, we, uh, we got to run. Anything else? What are your thoughts about football, basketball right now? No, guys, man, real I just, quick? Uh, just, just want to chime in. call in and catch up with you guys. All right. Sounds great. Really all appreciate right. it, Joe. You, you take care of yourself. It's great to talk to you. All right? Thanks for, thanks. Thanks for, check talking to you. Thanks thanks for checking in. There bye he goes. Bye. Jolton Joe. Good, good to hear from him. Longtime subscriber. Spartan Magazine, SpartanMag.com. And, yes, we did, uh, we did have to escort him away from the message board because he was <laughs> – he uh, – he wasn't afraid to, to uh, challenge people to uh, wrestling matches here and there. All right, let's go over here to the chat area and see what kind of questions we have. We've not gotten to any of these yet. This was back earlier in the show when I didn't have the audio working. Um, Steve S., good to have him here. M.M. Drippy saying, let's go. Can my guy Big Movie call in talk football recruiting? M.J. says, Comp, what's your opinion of the two football commits? All right, that's another question that has come to the forefront over here in the mailbag area. Let's see, where did, where was it? Here it is right here. Question number three, Matt from Ravenna, Michigan. What is your evaluation of the current commits? Now, Jonathan Slack, we talked about him a little bit. Um, Michigan State interested in him primarily as a center, maybe guard later, but they're looking at him as a center long-term. Jonathan Slack, Detroit King. Uh, when I look at his film, I saw him a lot last summer. I thought he was okay, pretty good, uh, better than okay. Um, three stars about right for him, I would say. When I look at his junior film, you know, he can bend his knees. He's a burly guy, but he can bend his knees and get down, get that pad level down, moves decently well. You know, for Detroit King, played left tackle and right tackle, uh, but probably a center 
for uh, Michigan State. Um, I was just looking at his junior film today. Honestly, I saw him a lot last summer, but I hadn't had a chance to really study his junior film yet. Looked, you know, I breezed through it today, but we'll look at it more in the future. As far as the pape goes, uh, here he is from from Iowa. Now he's six five, and you know he's ranked what number one thirty two in the country. Uh, offensive lineman. Here he is against this guy, Logan Reichart, who's a top 100 out of Missouri. This is in the Rivals camp last year. And Reichart gets a hold of him a little bit. But outside pass rush here, Reichart's a big guy at about 350. That contact right there knocks him off balance a little bit. But you see a little bit of strength to pop there at the end to, to get to this. I mean, Reichart wins this one. But he gets a good chuck on him here. But... Uh, that left foot is planted, and he doesn't blow him out. He still rallies back to the point a little bit. They go again. He'll go outside and fake and go to the inside. Fake outside, coming back in with a counter. But uh, Reichert's pretty good. Top 100 guy. That was at the Rivals camp last summer. Now you're going to see on this one, you're going to see DePape with some uh, straight line speed, chasing it down from behind on a little pass. Running pretty good here for a defensive end. Someone else was asking me who he reminds me of. Um, yeah, it's a big six foot five defensive end who runs well, but most importantly, the combination of the size, strength, some long arms, runs well, but also can can bend the corner, can run the hoop, which is something I talked about that recently with guys like, you know, um, who's number five for Michigan State defensive end? Darn it! Let's see here. I want to say Michael Bennett, but it's not Michael Bennett. He was a running back at Wisconsin. What's the guy's name? I'm looking it up. This is where you don't you don't start a you don't start a sentence unless you know how the sentence is going to end. Anyway, it's not Michael Fletcher. Michael Fletcher. Yeah, you know Fletcher, good. You know, pretty good defensive end. Didn't play a whole lot this year, but Fletcher does not have that ability to turn the turn the hoop. This guy does. And we'll see it on some of this film here. He's countering to the inside now. Chased it. What is he? Again, he's running on this one. He's running this alley pursuit sideline to sideline. He's double teamed initially. Now he's going to be running across on the hash, but you see him. Good acceleration. Just good athletic ability. He's at the hash mark right now, and now he's accelerating and closing in like a horse to Pape. This is the guy from Iowa, top 250, four star, committed to Michigan State. Now he's a nine technique, two point stance. But you see him turn the corner there. Now he's unblocked. But you can see him turn the corner and accelerate through it and, and, you know, kill shot at the end. But that ability to turn the corner is so important for a pass rusher. Left offensive end. What's this one? Unblocked. On this one, get that body lean. That left ankle right there and right ankle, they're going to talk about ankle flexibility, the ability to turn the corner, plant, and keep turning the corner and pick up speed while you're getting blocked inside out. He's got it right there. Defeats that block, hones in, s strip sack. This is junior film. What do we have here? I've watched these, but I need to. Withstands it with good balance. He's got the closing quickness. The guy blocking him here is not the biggest guy in the world, but he dispatches him. But again, body lean, ankle flexibility, accelerate through it, pass rush. I, if you can't tell, I, I like this guy as a pass rusher. He's got some strength to him, which should translate well as a, in run defense. Long arm in this guy, kind of a bull rush, disengages. Another violent finish. Left defensive end. Unblocked on his own read. Changes direction. It's a handoff here now. Now the change of direction right there. That's an athletic play. I know this isn't the, the greatest opposition, but anytime you're unblocked and you got this guy coming in motion is probably one of their best athletes. Unblocked, change of direction, and they're running the play right at him. They're like, we're going to run right at this guy. We're going to leave him unblocked, but he's not going to be able to make this play. Well, guess what? He makes the play. Unblocked, change direction, boom, and the fumble. Now 
Little head and shoulder move. Where was it? Head and shoulder move here. Shoulder move to the inside, 73. Leans that way. Hands. Chop. But again, turn in the corner. Ankle flex right there. Lean. Get in the lean. Ankle flex. It's a good pass rush. Where is he at? Left defensive end. A ladder move to the outside. Defeats one. He's got another one. Just on recess there, chasing the guy down. More of the same. There's more of him. More examples of the ankle flex takeoff. All right, he, he abused this guy pretty good. Pretty good size on this left tackle for this team in this Ohio State type of uniform. Outside move, counter to the inside with the dip or with the with the rip. Counter inside with a rip and strong. It's a big guy right here that he's going against. Gets through with a rip, finishes, and 79's upset at himself. 79's going against him again here. I didn't even see that. Did he, did, he, did he do a chop there? Chop, dip, and rip? Yeah, a little chop. He didn't dip a whole lot with the rip, but again, the body lean. Something my guy Fletcher can't really do. Right foot down, left foot, ankle flexibility to turn the corner, getting pushed by a big guy, stays on track toward the quarterback. 6'5". I think he's listed at 240. With that frame, you know, people are listed at 6'5", end up being 6'4", or whatever, but type of guy that I think can comfortably get up around 270 and still... I would imagine still have that quickness and ability to turn the corner. Now he's got some maturing to do off the field, maturing to do in a lot of ways, but that's a, that's a little dip move, dip and rip. So he's able to bend. I'm not saying he can bend like Willickus. Now Willickus was so flexible; he was a practically a gymnast. But this guy, you know, the rip, he dips to get this this rip move. He gets low, low, and strong through it. One of the somebody was asking me about comparisons. Some people that come to mind. He's got a little Panashuk in him. Panashuk, Jacob Panashuk has a frame and speed. But like that, like this one, he's unblocked. And unblocked, but watch him read and turn the corner. And he does not come apart. He's a sports car for a big guy. But boom, just right in the change of direction. Being two places at once. Spinning a web out there like a spider. Standing up now. Or is he, is he the four-point technique? Yeah, he's four-point now. Two-gap and disengage. Chasing him down, outside in, outside leverage. And doesn't break down, doesn't slow down when he when he gets home on this one. You know, he did, he's, he's through the target. Some athletic stuff that coaches like. He's through him. He's not, like, breaking down and leaving himself prone to getting faked out. All right, left defensive end out here at a nine. Wide splits on this one. They're running a stretch out here to his side. They got three people blocking him. Spins out of it, makes the tackle. Left defensive end. This is do, do, no, reduce inside, two gap, disengage. Not against the greatest opposition, but not bad. But uh, like I said, he's got some maturing he's got to do, like a lot of 17 year olds. But he's a bull rider. And he was impressed by Jordan, the new defensive ends coach. Motor there, motor coming through. Where is he at? Left defensive end. Two gap. Playing the run. Closing quickness. And there's a number of these highlights. It's a junior. It's not like he's got like five good highlights. He has dozens and dozens of highlights. So the motor is on a lot. Uh, turn the corner on that one too. They're, looks like they're leaving him unblocked for like an outside in trap, but the trapper doesn't get to him. He's unblocked. But again, he's going against a, he's going against a running back athlete here on this one. Did I lose it? That's a different one. That's the closing speed one. One of the closing speed ones. What do we have here? I might have lost it. Is this the one? 
Yeah, number one is the running backs can get a little pitch. Number one is the running backs can get pitched to the right. Dupe is inside. And they kind of kind of do it an outside in trap, but the trapper 83 doesn't get to him. So he's unblocked, and the running back's gonna get a pitch, and he's got to chase down a running back. Now he gets help from a teammate corralling it outside in, but the change of direction here, unblocked, change of direction to chase down a running back. Unblocked, change of direction, and goes. Does not come apart, accelerates through that. Change of direction, boom. That's uh that's 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 top 200. That's why he's top 200, things like that. Michigan State going out to Iowa to get this guy. Same foot, same shoulder contact, wins. Gets off. Outside in, move. He's got counter, he's got speed to the outside, dip and rip, good hands, ankle flex. A little dip there with, with stands a hit from a little guy. Converges, he's got extra gears. Good uh, good guy to have in the program. I think it's a good one. All right, I'm not, I'll, I guess I'll just... That's probably enough of that. But anyway, uh, let's do Pape. Uh, he asked me my opinions on that guy. I think he looks like a winner. I think he's a good guy to have. He's got some maturing to do. A lot of them do. And But he's what, they, he's what a lot of them... What you want him to look like, a lot of them. 6'5", change direction, pretty good takeoff, uses his hands well, that ankle flexibility to turn the corner, extra gear of closing speed, ragdolls you at the end, playing the run pretty well, active, exuberant. He's a bull rider. Duffy used to say he likes effers, fighters, bull riders. I can't say effers. Duffy Doherty used to say he liked effers, fighters, bull riders. He's in the bull rider category. All right, what else do we have here? Well, we're going to go back here to the uh, to the mailbag. I hope that didn't bore anybody, but if it did, you're watching the wrong show because this is, I don't care if it's February, we're talking football, we're getting after it. We talked basketball at the outside of the show extensively with Paul Konerdyke. If you've got any basketball questions, go ahead and shoot them over there in the chat area. We will get to them. My battery is at 4% and holding. Okay. A wise guy said, well, cop, plug it in, cop. It is plugged in. That's the problem. It says the battery is not charging, and this is a new battery in this thing. Maybe it's time for a new laptop, which is too bad because I kind of like this laptop. Got a lot of miles on it, though. We're over 300,000 miles on this baby. Anyway, so Dupape, nice start there for Michigan State. All right, Spartan Fan 81 from Orange County, California. It's uh, 1119 here Eastern time, so it's 819 out there in Orange County. So Spartan Fan 81 is probably just now getting off the freeway, getting home, watching some Spartan Mag Live out on the West Coasters. He says, any news on guys impressing in winter workouts or guys working out on position changes for the spring? That's the question from Spartan Fan 81. I'm not hearing anything about position changes. And judging by the last two winters, well, two winters ago was still pandemic, but... I don't know if they uh, talk position changes a whole lot at this time of year. I've not heard of that. And I'm not sure they do that right now. And it, but even if they were, I've not heard anything. I'm a little wondering about, I think they're a little bit low on safeties and might have a surplus of corners. Um, I've not heard this, just guessing. Would not be shocked if a corner got a shot at safety. You know, they tried Angelo Gross last year. Didn't work out so great. Maybe he plays closer up there in the nickel, which he did in the bowl game. Maybe he does that next year. You know, Darius Snow moved out to safety in the bowl game. I asked Tucker about that a little bit a couple of weeks ago. He thought he looked pretty good in the bowl game at safety. He also played safety in the second half against Ohio State. But he wasn't really indicating whether that would be the long-term plan with Darius Snow. Um... As far as others, you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, Ronald Williams has safety size to him. Could he move out to safety? Don't know. But anyway, good questions. I haven't heard anything about uh, winter football. And, you know, they keep things kind of quiet with some of those things also.
Question number six, MSU for life out of parts unknown. He says, which high school recruit from our 2022 class of signees do you think will end up having the best, most impactful Michigan State football career five years from now? Great question. Very difficult question to answer. Um, I look, you know, I read your question earlier and I looked through it and nobody really, really jumped off the screen to me. There's, there's many different candidates. Now, if Keaton House, Keaton Hauser becomes the quarterback, then in terms of impact, no one has a bigger impact than a quarterback, whether it's good or bad. But Hauser would be the possible guy. I think he, he's well equipped. I think he's got an it, it factor to him. He's got some swashbuckling playmaking, and he's got some trick shot accuracy to him. Quick release, um, comes in ahead of the game in compared to, to, to most freshmen. So Hauser could be the guy, but I mean, Nick Foles came to Michigan State and didn't start, okay? You, you know, you're only starting one quarterback. Keith Nickel, I still say, might have been an NFL quarterback, but he played behind Bradford, played behind Cousins, two NFL guys. Moved to wide receiver as one of the ultimate team players in recent Michigan State history. But I, I think that he might have been an NFL quarterback. He transferred to Michigan State. Michigan State was better off for it. If he had transferred to Central Michigan, he might have become Danny Lefevre. Talking about Keith Nickel. Lefevre was drafted at quarterback. Didn't stick. Nickel might have. I don't know. But anyway, my point is you can be a good quarterback and not get your chance and have to move on. I think Caden Hauser is going to be a quarterback uh, probably at Michigan State. He's at Michigan State. He's going to make an impact somewhere. But in this day and age of transfers, that's just the name of the game at the quarterback position. You're asking me who in this class is most likely to make the biggest impact five years from now. Odds are it's going to be the quarterback. That being said, Dante Moore's, he's not committed or anything, but he's a big-time quarterback recruit. And I think Michigan State's got a good shot at him. So Caden Hauser could be that good, but end up in the same program with Moore. And I don't know how that shakes out. I don't know if there's a safer pick. I think Jaden Mangum has a lot of ability as a, as a, as a safety. You know, they brought in some defensive backs that are all somewhat, they're all talented. Um... I have trouble differentiating, you know, who's the best of that lot. They're all pretty good. I think Jeremy Bernard, you know, about 6'2 or whatever. I liked his film a lot. Legit four-star from Henderson, Nevada. I think he's got the goods to be. I think his tools translate well to the college level. I think he's a, a strong bet to do well at the college level. You know, Vance Summer in there at defensive tackle. Man, he looks good in the t-shirt camps. Explosive, motor. I mean, you take film of him and you, you swear that the film is on fast speed because he's that quick. Then you watch him for Essexville Garber with the pads on and he's going against competition that's just not good enough to hold him. So I'm not sure. You know, it, it's, it's hard to see. Like I said on the Tim Stout show today, sometimes you don't know how someone's going to do until they get into the major leagues and hit a major league curveball. Right? So Van Summeren, you're not going to know until he gets in the big leagues and college football and takes on some college offensive lineman but he he's an interesting one it might be Van Summeren you know there's some good offensive linemen in this class but offensive linemen tend to have the the highest likelihood of upper body injuries that can disrupt a a uh, a career um of the offensive linemen I kind of like Braden Miller the best but Ashton Lepo out of Grand Haven is keeps getting bigger and he's athletic and he is he continues to mature as an athlete. I think one of the more underrated guys in this class is Terrell Henry, the wide receiver from Roseville. Explosive athlete, very good hands, can really high point it. I think he's underrated. I think Antonio Gates has a world of ability, but he has some maturing to do, a lot of it. Um, they talk about having to check the ego at the door. He's going to have to check his ego at the door and and uh, relearn some things. But he's got a world of ability. So I'm going to dodge the question and not say anybody in particular. The quarterback has the highest ceiling to have the highest impact. Bernard, I think, at wide receiver might be the safest pick. But good question. Interesting fodder for conversation. Thanks for the question. 
Question number seven, Spartan Woody from Grand Rapids says, when I look at the football roster, Michigan State returns five or six offensive starters, nine defensive starters. He said, we upgraded the speed on defense and replaced some offensive playmaking ability via the portal. All transfers thus far have starter level ability. That's what Spartan Woody says. He says, I don't know if it will lead to more wins, but there's, this roster has more talent and more depth everywhere except offensive line. Do you agree? What are your thoughts? I agree with all that, except you're forgetting about Kenneth Walker the third. Not as much talent at running back, and that'll make a difference. Question number eight, MSU Spartan 777 from New Hudson, Michigan. But, uh, T, I got to go back to that question a moment ago. You're right, and I don't think you included um, Barker, the tight end, in that. Well, I guess you probably did. That adds some talent at tight end. They'll be, And then you have Malik Carr coming in. The talent at tight end will be better this year than last year. Wide receivers, you lose Naylor, and Naylor was a was an asset. They're going to miss him, but other guys get a year older and a year better. Jaden Reed's going to be good. Trey Mosley's good. Montori Foster gets a year better. Keon Coleman gets a year better. Running back, not as good. Still could be pretty good. Quarterback will be a year better. So that, that's all looking good. I'm sure Peyton Thorne's excited about Barker at tight end. Got to be. Question number eight. I think we're going basketball here. MSU Spartan 777 from New Hudson, Michigan says, if I had to predict, he said, if you had to predict today, what would you guess is the best and worst case scenario for the Michigan State basketball team in the NCAA tournament this year? And who would you pick as your top two favorites to win the NCAA tournament this year? Top two picks. I'm not very creative here, but Auburn is good. And we talked about this with Nils two weeks ago that I've been impressed with Bruce Pearl as a coach for a long time. I know that he's a cartoon character, a little bit of a buffoon, taking his shirt off, painting himself orange, jumping around in the stands in Knoxville, Tennessee, that type of stuff. I actually got a, I got respect for that. I think that's great. But make no mistake about it, he can coach. He can flat-out coach. We saw it when he had Tennessee against Michigan State in the regional finals in 2010. I mentioned this with Nils. Everybody knows I love Tom Izzo. I think he's great, one of the all-time greats. I love going to watch his practices because it's history every time you get a chance to watch that guy practice, watch that guy run a practice. He's one of the masters. He puts forth a basketball Rembrandt every time you watch him in practice. In my opinion. But and 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 hey, Shashevsky's the first or second best ever to do it in the college ranks. But Izzo outcoached him in the regional final 2019. I'm not saying Izzo's better than Shashevsky, but that day he outcoached him. Everybody knows I think Izzo's great, but that day I thought Bruce Pearl outcoached Izzo in the regional final in St. Louis with some of the icing of the ball screens and things like that. They, they did a great job. Michigan State was fortunate to win. They got a good, they got a favorable call on a Raymar Morgan play late in the game, hit the two, two free throws. He didn't get fouled, but they called a foul. And then the basketball gods evened it out the next week in the final four when Draymond Green did get fouled, but they didn't call it against Butler. But anyway, um, Bruce Pearl, good. You watch Auburn now. I mean, good with their inbound plays, good with inbound defense, baseline inbound defense. Good with some of that transition game. They run a little bit of something that looks like the Heathcote transition game after made baskets, counter break blitz, um, ball screen defense. That That's the name of the game in college basketball these days. I mean, everybody, it, talent is the most important thing. But the thing that differentiates the good teams from the champions, I think, is on the defensive end, especially um, now with the shorter shot clock. You don't get as much variety of offensive styles. Everybody in college basketball runs the same stuff. Dan Dockett used to complain about that. Everybody just kind of does one or two things, then they get into their ball screen actions because you don't have much time to do stuff. That being said, in the NBA, there's teams doing a wide variety of things, but they're such good shooters, they, it spreads things out so much because you have to honor all those guys as shooters. But anyway, in the college ranks, ball screen defense is everything. When Michigan State beat Michigan two weeks ago with Jawan Howard, I mean, Michigan State undressed Michigan. Izzo pantsed Howard in that game. Ball screen defense. Michigan State was doing several different versions of ball screen defense. Michigan tried to do something, then and then uh, they started splitting it when Dickinson was coming out too high, and then when he dropped off, they were starting to shoot against that one. And then Michigan got to where they're like, okay, we're just going to switch. Which you can do if you've got really good athletes. They don't have the athletes to switch, but they were like, just, let's just make it simple and switch. And Michigan State um, had success against all of it, and Michigan didn't have any answers. We'll see if it's better for the rematch. Michigan was very well coached last year. Um, this year, not as much. We'll see what they can do here in the coming weeks. Anyway, ball screen defense is so important for basketball coaching. 
and Bruce Pearl, they do a wide variety of things with their ball screen defense. And I heard Jay Billis talking about it during the telecast, the Auburn-Alabama game a couple nights ago, and also the Bald Men on Campus podcast, Billis and Seth Greenberg. Greenberg's the best. He's the Greenberg's the best college basketball commentator out there, in my opinion, whether it be a podcast or in the studio, the best. And this podcast, it was Billis and Greenberg. Last year, it was Greenberg and Dockich, which I thought was great. Now Dockich no longer employed with ESPN, so they have Billis with them. And Billis is pretty good. Billis and Greenberg is very good. They usually have Billis, Greenberg, and Alfonso Ellis, and that's okay, but three people is too much for a podcast. This time, Ellis wasn't there, so he just had the two, so Greenberg got to talk more, and it was great. Billis was talking about that he spent some time in the film room with Bruce Pearl in advance of the Alabama-Auburn game. And Billis said on the podcast he said that the multiplicity of things like ball screen coverages were things that in the early 80s when he was at duke that they would never dream of doing there is so much more volume so much more that these players have to know uh defensively in terms of coverages and how coverages change through the course of a game at michigan state and probably auburn too sometimes ball screen coverages can change through the course of a single possession you know, if, if it's a ball screen this way with this guy who can shoot, you get over it and you can hedge help recover. And then they go over here and it's a DHO to this guy who can't shoot. Then you're going to go under it and, you know, keep him out of the lane. Don't let him penetrate. And you have to know who's coming. Is that guy a shooter or a driver? And if it's a shooter, you're getting out and over it. If it's a driver, you're going under the screen. You have to know these things right now and, and recognize them right now while you are dead tired. And it's hard to do. And that's new for college basketball. And like Billis said, they never had to, had to do those things. And Billis asked Bruce Pearl, you know, how much of this has expanded in recent years? And he says it's, I think his quote was, Bruce Pearl said, it's, it's, it's increased tenfold over the last 10 or 15 years. Izzo's very good at it. If you've got good players that can do it and you have enough time to teach it and get it ironed out, that's all part of the get your crap together, tighten the screws over 30 games. The good ones can do it. Beard did it there at Texas, although at Texas Tech, but they do it differently with keeping people out of the middle, and they had a different way of going about it. But ball screen defense is so important. Auburn has it. They've got that first. They've got depth. they got the shot blocker, seven foot two. What's his name? Kessler. You know, Pearl says he's the best guy and best player in the country in the air. He alters a lot of shots. What, four blocks against Alabama and a lot more of, you know, altered shots. The shot selection gets crazy for Auburn, and they're not a very good three-point shooting team. And they let it fly. So if they're hot, they can really completely blow you out. But they can also hurt themselves a little bit with some of that shot selection. But they're missing shots, but they crash the offensive glass really well. They got the defense first. Good with the special teams, as Izzo likes to say. Transition game. Ball screen defense. And then they've got the number one pick that Joshua Smith. What's his name? Smith. Six, nine and a half. Sweet shooter. Skill. Poised. Respectful. Just a beautiful player. So you got all those things, all the screws tightening up, all the structure. They play at speed. He lets those guys really run up and down. Sometimes gets out of control a little bit. But then you've got that guy who's, who's a terrific one, who's, who's, who's number one pick. He's, he's the best player in the country. And then uh, you got the strength, the shot blocking. And the shot blocker's got a guy that comes in for him who's pretty good. they got multiple point guards. Wendell Green, you know, coming in. His shot selection gets crazy sometimes. But he reminds me a little bit of... What was the guy's name in North Carolina? Ty Lawson. What was that his name? He played in the NBA. Wendell Green's not that good, but he's you know, a, a kind of a fast, up-tempo, burly shooter. Maybe shoots too much, but just, I mean, they've got a lot of, uh, they got a lot of juice to them. But most importantly, they've got the coach to go with it. Pearl's good. He gets disrespected in a lot of ways because he's had some problems with the NCAA law cartoon character but don't kid yourself he's a good coach so i'm gonna go you know auburn i I know that's not a that's not a uh not going out on a limb when you pick the team that's number one in the country the team they lost to was uconn right they lost to uconn in the bahamas is that right right before michigan state played uconn uconn was good back then they've had some injuries now gonzaga i still think you know they're they're good they're good i don't know if you know they still have their problems with quickness Baylor has had injuries. They're outstanding beginning of the season. I don't know if top to bottom they've got everything, but they've had injuries too, including Akinjo at the point. Purdue, problems at point guard. Very good, but problems at point guard. Kentucky's rising fast. 
Oscar Sheboy. Is that his name? Sheboy? Oscar, what's his name? Crazy rebounder. And the point guard, Ty Ty Washington, doing good things. When Kentucky's lost, they've had injuries. Kentucky, I hate to see Kentucky. I don't know. I'm not the biggest Kentucky fan. You, you know, it's, who wants to see them rise up and win the national title, right? But they're playing right now. If the tournament were going on right now, Kentucky would, would be right up there. But you're asking me, what would, where is Michigan State? I think Michigan State right now is like a sweet 16 team. Win a game and then win that second game on a one-day rest, which would be against a good team. You come back to the next weekend, you've had a really good season. Izzo's really good on a one-day prep. If it's a week-long prep, it kind of evens out. He's good. A lot of other coaches are good, too. But that Sweet 16, they've beaten Virginia in that spot a few times. Um, beat Duke, okay, of course, in 05 in the Sweet 16. But I think they're Sweet 16 right now. Can they get better than Sweet 16? Can they become Sweet 16 and beyond? Yes, they can. How can they get there? Bingham has, Now that Bingham has his fatigue level strained out again, he needs to go from here and, and become a better player than we've seen him be. He did it on defense earlier in the year. We've seen a little bit of it here lately. He's got to get the rebounding better. He's got to get strong on the block better. He's going against Coburn coming up soon. He's gone against Dickinson. You know He's going to see E.D. at Purdue. Um, he's going to see these big dudes, and that's going to help him in the tournament when he sees lesser big men, big men that aren't as big and strong and talented, unless you get a rematch in the Big Ten. But that's going to help Bingham. He's got to remain, retain health, remain healthy, get that fatigue level up, and where he was in J December before things were interrupted, he needs to get back on there and keep improving. We don't know what Bingham looks like. He could look better in four weeks. Max Christie, same thing. He could be on the rise. Gabe Brown's got to get his shot back and get over his slump and get back to what he was doing in you know late November, early December, be that player. No need to be hunting shots like Reggie Miller. Find it. Let it come to you. The two-headed monster at point guard um, has been hot and cold. That can get better. Ty Lawson, Ty, Ty Walker, Tyson Walker has to show that he can with confidence, step in there and hit shots like he's playing for Northeastern again. They could use that. You've seen when he's at his best and Hogarth's at his best, those guys could be plus point guards. And the, the the stretch four is a very good position for Michigan State. Malik Hall getting better all the time. Joey Hauser really coming to the party nicely. Marble is a good, solid backup center. Right? So all those things are good enough now for Sweet 16 if they play well and don't turn the ball over like crazy. The capacity is there for them to have... You know, can they have that Trice, Denzel Valentine, Brandon Dawson, Matt Costello Final Four type season and surprise people? Um, they would need some favorable matchups. They would need, uh, you know, whoever the big wig is in their bracket. It would help if that team got bounced, knocked out before they get to them. Like in, was it 2010 when Kansas was upset by Bucknell? And then Michigan State played in what, Northern Iowa in the Sweet 16. That helped a lot. Then they, they beat Northern Iowa in the Sweet 16. And then they had Tennessee in the regional final. Things like that, this team is capable of you know, picking up some garbage and benefiting from other trash, other bracket buster trash. They could do it. I'm not saying they're going to get in the tournament and just like knock off in one region, you know, beat Kansas, beat Kentucky, get at the Final Four. You know, I don't know if they can match with those type of teams. But it's worth watching, and you got 30 games, get your crap together, and they're, it's not like they've hit their wall. They've got, they're have got a seven-man playing group, and they're not going to get any better, which is the way it was. Like If you remember like Drew Neitzel's junior year, when they kind of barely got in there, and they did real well. They beat Marquette in the first round, then they played North Carolina in the second round down in Winston-Salem, and Michigan State played really well that day, and Izzo outcoached Roy Williams, but they still lost by 12 or 14 because North Carolina just kept throwing too many people at them, wore them down. But that Neitzel team only had seven guys, and they could only get so good, and Neitzel was worn down by the end of the year, so that team had hit its ceiling, and you knew the ceiling was low. They did a good job getting in and winning a game that year. This team's ceiling is still higher. We don't know how high it can go. So it's worth watching as Izzo continues to, to tighten those, those screws. Trying to get defensive rebounding better. And then once that's better, I'll get back to getting the running game going. Turnovers. You know, 13, what they have? 12 turnovers against Maryland. It was a manageable number. Problem is they came in bunches again. They had three in a row right there that led to that 11-0 run. And then they had like three 
turnovers in, in five possessions, like at the six-minute mark, at a time when it looked like Michigan State might be taking control of the game, but ended up being close down to the wire. So I guess there's never a good time for turnovers. But I don't know. That's still a, something they're walking on, working on also. All right, Sparty from Pauley's Island, South Carolina, says, just curious your take on how the Michigan basketball game against Michigan State was rescheduled for March 1st and how it went down. Do you believe Izzo had any say in the matter, or is it all Big Ten Conference-driven? Seems like we have little to gain from it, while it might be a critical game needed for Michigan to make the big dance. Um, yeah, it could be critical for Michigan if they win some games in the meantime. I think Michigan's going to hit a wall between February 1st, February 12th. I think Michigan has five games in 12 days. I think there's a there's a span in there where they've got three games in five days. I know they've got talent. They did some good things for Michigan State for a little while, but they ran out of gas against Michigan State in that game. And I think they'll run out of gas in that, that stretch of five games and 12 games in early February, which is starting right now. It's February, what, 3rd right now? So it's taking place right now. Um, so I'm not sure Michigan's going to – I think Michigan's going to be out of it by then. I don't even think they're going to be a bubble team. I could be wrong, but that's my thought on that one. Did Izzo have any say in it? No, that was all Big Ten Conference, which means it was all d- done by the TV. Michigan versus Michigan State was supposed to be on Fox. It was a Saturday afternoon game, which is a big – game in the Fox college basketball package postponed so that inventory is gone they got to move it somewhere they keep it within the Fox family they put it on FS1 but Fox was going to see to it that that game was played Izzo had nothing to say about it game 10 game 10 question 10 Brad from from Mooresville North Carolina which he says is race city USA Okay, it says, Jim, love the content. You and the staff are second to none at SpartanMag.com, which is why I've been a subscriber since 2001. Well, thanks a lot, Brad, in North Carolina. Appreciate that. He says, would you care to speculate on any position changes we might see in spring football or even next fall? You know, I mentioned that a moment ago. Safety, possibly. You know, someone like Ben Vance or Alex Van Summeren, the older Van Summeren, the linebacker Van Summeren, um... He's a big, strong athlete that's got good straight line speed and does not quite have enough speed or quickness at linebacker. You know, they use him in the red zone. He can thump a little bit. But what that Van Summeren is, that guy is a is a fullback, you know? He's a blocking back. Michigan State doesn't really use a blocking back. I mean, that guy transferred to Michigan State. They're happy to have him. His brother's on his way. Uh, he's a happy Spartan and everything. But that guy probably should have looked at Wisconsin. I think he's a, I think he's a good fullback. Michigan State doesn't use a fullback. But, no, I don't have any bright ideas on position changes. You know, Davion Prim at running back, do you, do you take a look at him at, at in the defensive backfield somewhere? Maybe, because it's crowded at running back right now, and at least one or two of those guys is going to have to move on. In the meantime, does he, does he try his luck? I know they played at least one day in the defensive backfield last August in preseason camp. But Prim, it's going to be hard for him to find a foot in the door in that uh, running back room. Spefton from East Lansing says, question number 11, what's the matter with Gabe Brown? What can be done about it? Uh, that's his question. You know, Konadike and I talked about this earlier in the show, and Izzo talked about it earlier today in the press conference after practice. And he says, Gabe Brown's just in a slump, and the way you get out of it is you just keep shooting, you just keep working. And Gabe Brown is a worker. Now, his shots looked a little flatter here and there. I think it's because he's rushed it here and there. You know, he had a couple of games where he only had six or seven shots because defenses are getting out on him a little bit more. He's a marked man in the in the scouting report, so it's made it harder for him to find his shot windows. So he, I think he quickened. He's always had a quick shot trigger, but quick, but also um, not always great decisions. Easy for me to say, as I always say with an asterisk. Easy for me to say when I'm watching on TV or at the game, eating a hot dog, drinking hot chocolate or something with maybe some refreshments pouring in, and I'm like, um, bad shot selection. Yeah, easy for me to say. Fat slob at the sideline, me. He's an actual accomplished scholarship athlete and a great one. But, you know, so he's looking to do what he can do for the team. He's not hunting shots for himself. He's just trying to be what Gabe Brown is supposed to be. But I think Izzo did not like some of the shot selection against Maryland. That's part of the reason why Gabe Brown sat during crunch time minutes in that game. First time in the season, Gabe Brown has sat like that. Akins was in there playing some pretty good defense, doing some good things with rebounding. It's not always going to be like that, but in that particular game, that was an interesting message to Gabe Brown. Gabe Brown was back in at the end, though. Izzo loves Gabe Brown, so they'll work through it. He's just going to keep shooting, and he's 3 of 17 in the last four games. I think that'll start increasing. His his uh, 
three point percentage for the year is down to like 36 percent now he's up in the comfortably in the in the 40s earlier in the year but they need if they're going to be a sweet 16 team he needs to be that guy that's two for five most nights 40 percent from three I know he's been one for five it's only one shot difference between one for five and two for five but there's a big difference between one for five and two for five so you know, he was doing a good job earlier in the year also at shot fake one dribble, 15 footer, rise, fire, hit the medium range shot. At six foot eight with his ability to elevate, and he's a good shooter, that should, the in between game should be a weapon for him. He didn't have it earlier in his career. He showed it earlier this season. Now he's gone away from it. Now defenses are more mindful of him. When he shot fakes, put it on the deck once, he's got more eyeballs looking at him, ready to react and get it out of his hands, but that's okay. Shot fake, you know, one dribble. If they're at him, just move the ball. So I think he's somewhere between. You know, trying to get those shots. Izzo used to say, hey, Michigan State's getting so many turnovers. If Michigan State just stopped turning it over, someone like Gabe Brown would get an extra two shots per game. So they're mindful of it, maybe to a, to a detriment, hunting, not, in, not selfishly, but looking for shots that aren't there. Izzo did not like shot selection here. There, He didn't name any, didn't name any names, but here and there he did not like shot selection. At Maryland, so Gabe Brown's doing what he can, but he's got to find a happy medium there and let it come to him. And he's got the talent to take to uh, get it done. But um, it's a concern right now. Izzo plays it off like it's just he's a worker and he'll work through it. And he's just in a slump and he'll be fine. Sometimes guys don't come out of slumps, right? Adam Ballinger, Chris Hill, their senior years did not come out of slumps. Um. So, but Izzo's not going going to say anything that's going to put added pressure on it. So what a coach does is a coach says, hey, he's working at it. He'll be fine. That's what you say. And then privately, you're like, okay, so uh, I don't have any, I don't have like any pixie dust or magic wand. Izzo says he's got to work at it. He's working. He's a hard worker. That's all he can do. Uh, somebody was asking about defensive line coach. Yeah, that's going to be Marco Coleman, probably going to be announced tomorrow. Georgia Tech, he's in the Hall of Fame at Georgia Tech. Played 12 years in the NFL. And coaching wise, and then he was in the private sector for a couple of years, for a few years. Then got back into coaching in 2017 with the Eagles as a coaching fellow, and uh, also was defensive coordinator at Mandarin High School in Miami. So he has ties in South Florida. Somebody posted, I think he's from Ohio originally, which is interesting. Raiders assistant coach for one year, D-line coach, went to Georgia Tech. We talked about him earlier, but he was outside linebackers, defensive ends coach at Georgia Tech. And this guy leaving his alma mater. He's in the Hall of Fame at Georgia Tech, and he's leaving Georgia Tech to go to Michigan State. That's how much, that's how highly respected Mel Tucker is right now. My buddy Nils, who's on this show a lot, he knows a guy that coached with him at Georgia Tech, and he speaks very highly of Coleman. So Coleman and Jordan are two very interesting uh, additions. I think they're going to recruit real well. I think they're going to teach individual skills real well. In terms of the macro D line, they don't really have that venerable guy who's proven to make in game adjustments based on what the opponent's doing. So they're going to have to figure that one out. Those guys will learn as they go. Hazelton will be involved, but Hazelton's down in the field and so is Tucker. So they need somebody up in the booth to help with those things. That'll be new territory. I'm sure they've already thought about that. So Michigan State's playing Rutgers on Saturday. Rutgers is 12 and 9, 6 and 5 in the Big Ten. Rutgers is 6 and 5 in the Big Ten. That sounds like a pretty decent record to me, but that's only good for eighth in the Big Ten. But they're in the standings. They're ahead of Iowa. They're ahead of Penn State, Maryland, Northwestern, Nebraska. McKay, Paul McKay, the guy with the headband, looks like he should be at the beach playing volleyball or something. But he's a top 150 recruit. Izzo was asked about him today because Mulcahy he scored 31 against Northwestern earlier this week. And Mulcahy he'll play the one, the two, the three. Uh, Izzo said he'll play the four, but I've not seen that. But Mulcahy he leads the team in assists. Uh, against Northwestern, he scored 31. And he was two out of three from three-point range. So it's not like he got crazy hot from deep, but he had a good game. He's only averaging eight points a game. So the 31 was a little bit of an aberration, but leads the team in assists. Solid player. I mean, the, the key players are Ron Harper Jr. at 6'6", senior, and Geo Baker, 6'4", senior. Those wings will drive you. Ron Harper Jr. had the game winner against Purdue from half court or whatever it was. 42% from three-point range this year, 15.8 points per game. You guys have seen Ron Harper Jr. over the years. Six foot six. With his physicality, does Gabe Brown guard him? Probably. Geo Baker, who guards him? Max Christie, maybe. Geo Baker, 6'4", senior. Only 31% from three, so he's not, you know, you got to be 33% or above to really get it going. From three-point range, he's not been as hot 
as uh, maybe they would like him to be. I'd have to go back to look at his his career stats to see if he's usually a, more than a 33% three-point shooter. I would think that he is. But Geo Baker's averaging 11.5. So those three are the ones to keep an eye on in the backcourt. Mulcahy, Harper, and Geo Baker. You know, Rutgers beat Iowa 49-48. to They've also beaten Purdue, and they beat Michigan. You go out there and play at Rutgers, you better play well. You better play better than you did against Maryland. Otherwise, Michigan State's going to lose a game. They've been playing with fire a little bit here and there, and it'd be a grouchy uh, fan base if they lose one. Because when Michigan State loses games to Northwestern or a, a shorthanded Illinois, or if they lose at Rutgers, it's like you're losing opportunities because you're, these are supposed to be winnable games. But winning at Rutgers, I don't know how winnable that is. Purdue didn't win there. All right, you know, some of the other questions. Let me go over here to the chat area. Hope you guys don't mind me rambling on. It's kind of what I do. I can't help it. Appreciate everybody coming here to Spartan Mag Live, talking Michigan State sports on a cold February night in mid-Michigan. I love the snow, man. We've got about 11 inches of snow. Got a brand new snow blower. I was out there taking it to task. I was doing some of the neighbor's driveways too, man. Out there with my kid doing just snow blowing. I kind of wish snow blowing was in the Winter Olympics. That'd be a gold medal threat. Got out there a little bit. Did some cross-country skiing today. I looked like a total buffoon, but I enjoyed it. Day before that, I did some snowshoeing. I looked even more like a buffoon, but I enjoyed it. I don't want it to be. I don't want it to be winter for eight months out of the year. I'm not saying I want to li- live on the Hudson Bay hunting polar bear or anything like that. But two months of winter a year is the way it should be, and I like it. The week before that, pond hockey. Can't do it now because there's too much snow. Had that warm up. And, um, you know, it had like eight inches of ice. And then it was like 45 degrees on Monday. So it melted on top. So it looked like a, looked like a mirror out there. And if it, if it had like that night had like frozen and gotten down to like 15 degrees for like three days, it would have been smooth. It would have been awesome. But instead, we got 11 inches of snow. So I'm not a physicist or anything. But that snow kind of puts a thermal layer on that water that was there. So now it's just slush on top. It's like two inches of slush on top of seven inches of ice and all that snow. So the the lake, I think, might be totaled for the rest of the year. I mean, the only hope would be is if all that, if it got down to like three degrees for like four days and then you go down there snow blowing and get all that snow out, but that's that's too much snow to move. I, the lake is there. Pond hockey might be done for the year, unfortunately. All right. Thanks to all the people that have given us a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. Go to SpartanMag.com, become a subscriber. Let me zip through the comments and reactions. What do we have here? All right. MM Drippy says, who starts at tight end? I think it's Barker. Come on down. It's got to be Barker. Spartoon89 Hicks says, hello, comp. Gordon Sinona says, present. Steve Smith313 says, class of 2023. Class looks promising. I would agree, Steve. Football, please, 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 first, MJ says. Well, I think we did a little bit, then we got deep into basketball. We've gone back and forth. Once again, thanks again to Don Strait. We got to his question early. Thanks to Don. Don's probably in bed now. (laughs) Waking him up in DeWitt, Michigan. We're waking him up over there. Wake him up. Pots and pans on the streets. Thanks to Don Strait. Appreciate it. James Bannon, how do you see these two? How do you see the two deep on the offensive line this next season? You know, I don't have my cheat sheet for the depth chart. Um... I, I, mm, I think Horst is going to be around. Same act at center. They still got to figure things out. I mean, Baldwin, the Juco guy, I think is going to be a second string tackle. Um, I don't think Buter's coming back. Duplain, it's going to be a left guard. Carrick is back at right guard. Off the top of my head, gosh. And then beyond that, you know, I've asked Kapilovic a little bit about who's looking good, the youngsters, and he says, we just got to wait and wait for spring. You know, uh, Vandermark's going to be in there a little bit. Isaiah has moved on, of course. Ohanba's moved on, of course. So, you know, Ohanba was looking like he was kind of gaining, gaining some traction there a little bit. And even Isaiah got on the field in some packages. So I would have thought those guys might have been the next men up, but they've moved on. So it's going to be a scramble. And... We'll keep our ears open in spring practice, and we'll talk to Kapilovic, and he might tell us what's going on if we get a chance to talk to him. But that spring game, that green-white game, is going to be very intriguing to see 
how they line up and what the depth chart is and who looks good. But I, I can't give you a complete 10-man too deep right now. Good question, though. Maga Sparty says, I need my Nils fixed. We didn't invite Nils this time. We didn't even invite him. Don't tell him I said that. Well, we had Conan Dyke want to talk some basketball. Um, Nils is entertaining, though, right? He's got great... Uh, He's got great, uh, strong opinions, and he's well-versed. And he knows the guy that coached with Coleman down in Georgia Tech. MJ says, big movie football talk. That's what we got. YT Spartan says, we got Broussard. More thumbs up. Thanks, Don. Steve Smith 313 says, cop, is Keon Coleman doing well in practice? He was an incredible player in high school. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to see him today. I've watched him in practice two or three times. Quick, as you would expect, quick footwork on defense. And that's what you have to be to get on the court if you're a defense, if you're a two-sport athlete. Because you're not going to ask that guy to come off screens and hit three-pointers. you got other guys that can do that that work on it all the time. And they work on it all the time, all the time, all the time, just to get to the point that they can become a three-point shooter like Gabe Brown, who's 3 of 17 in the last four games. So to think that Keon Coleman can roll off the football bench and and become a go-to offensive scorer. I mean, he's not scoring 63. But defense has to be there first. And he's got the footwork to be a defensive player. Now, I've watched him try to trail Max Christie around screens and half court set, and he gets lost going under screens, just not knowing how to do it. So he's got, he's got to learn those things, but also learn how Michigan State does it and how dead serious Michigan State is about doing it right. I compare it, to, can't compare it to Keebler. He's a better athlete than Keebler, of course. But Keebler came in after Kalen Lucas got hurt in 2010. Keebler came in and could play a defensive role. Never had him shoot or anything, but he played a role so that, so that the boat didn't sink. And that's what Ken Coleman would have to do first. And they're not going to need him to do that this year unless there's injuries. But it's not a bad thing to have him around just in case there are injuries. That's why they want to get Pierre Brooks a little more time also, just in case there's injuries, just get him some more experience get him more comfortable with it in case they need to play Pierre Brooks for some reason later in the year. And with that Michigan game late in the year, getting scrunched in there just before the Big Ten tournament, um, any mileage you can take off Max Christie's odometer is probably not a bad thing either. But Coleman has the juice. He's got a frame. He's got the quick feet. He looks like a scholarship basketball player. If he did not play football and just focused, focused on basketball, I think he could be a Big Ten starter, but he's not focusing on basketball, so don't expect that from him. I mean, Judd Heathcote said he thought that Andre Risen could have been an NBA player if he focused on basketball. Those of you that are old enough remember when Andre Risen played basketball. He was great at Flint Northwestern in high school, comparatively, but when he played basketball at Michigan State, he was kind of a role guy. I mean, he's kind of stiff, and he's just kind of okay because it's hard. I mean, these are high-level college basketball players that focus on basketball 365 a year, and to come in and do it for two months a year... um, hard to do so I think you know you know is always talking about how Matt Trannon started gaining traction as a basketball player once he spent his first summer on campus working out basketball with the guys he did his football too but he also put in time in basketball that might be what it what Keon Coleman needs to do you know get through this year learn about it and then this summer while he's on campus do more of the basketball maybe by next year he could uh, be more than just a curtain call feel good football walk on I don't want to say walk on but um he's doing well at you know to an extent I'm not saying I've watched him on the scout team I'm not saying he's a threat to come in and uh do great things but you saw that you know when they came out and pressured him that was quick to the hole with the uh left hand help defense arrived if that help defense hadn't arrived he would have went up and punched it real good he can get up and dunk it any way you want it I'll bet his vertical's up near in the high 30s. M.M. Drippy says, what freshman make an impact this year? Freshman. They need help at safety a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised if Jared, uh, if Jaden Mangum gets on the field a little bit. Freshman impact. I'll get this question a lot between now and August. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking one of those tight ends would have to help, but with Barker showing up, Maybe not as much, but if Hunt doesn't come back, I gotta find out more about Hunt. I should know that. I gotta look into that a little bit more. So Masunas might be able to help. 
as a blocking tight end? It's a great question. And this year, who are the freshmen that helped this year? The year before, there was only like one, right? All right, this year, Keon Coleman played a little bit late in the year. Hank Pepper was the snapper. Nate Ote was second string linebacker. Chuck Brantley, of course, at corner. Had an impact in the middle portion of the season. And that's pretty much it. So you're talking about one guy that was a regular. So it's hard to find one guy out of 22. I wasn't surprised it was Brantley. I'm, I'm usually not real great at forecasting which freshmen are going to help early. Because I usually look to see where they need help, which makes sense. But then I picked the wrong guy there. I don't know. But Brantley was a guy that I said would translate immediately to, to the college ranks. Had a really good chance to do so. And was a heavy hitter for a little guy in high school. Came to Michigan State. And what did all his teammates and coaches say? Heavy hitter for a little guy. Might have hit so hard that he broke himself as a freshman. Mr. Bone Man says, hello all from a snowy Harper Woods, Michigan. Uh, YT Spartan, how about Imani Bates? Well, I don't know. Did he, did he flat out quit? I've, I've not done all the research on that. But, you know, back when he elected not to go to Michigan State, then, then he brought Michigan State back into the fold, and Michigan State kind of said, I know things were good. On the message board, a lot of people were like, oh, man, that sucks. He would help so much. And I was kind of like, I didn't say it because it's it just real hard to defend that viewpoint. I didn't feel like getting in a court of law about it on the message board. But And, and how can you possibly say that you're better off without a talent like that? But now you kind of kind of see that what you've got going with Jay Nakins and Christie, you know, and Hogard. Some of these guys, you're trying to bring Hauser along. They're really happy with the way the guys are. OKGs are kind of guys. You bring in something like that, and it could just like screw everything up a little bit, and it just kind of hurts that solidification. And, you know, the year before, what, Duke had the guy, what was the guy's name, Jalen Johnson, big-timer, top-10 guy. Not quite where Bates is as a ranked guy, but... You know, Jalen Johnson was a headache and just quit for Duke in February. I mean, who quits at Duke? Well, that guy quit. And Krzyzewski said that his culture was, had really taken a, had been damaged. So, it's my understanding that, you know, they talked about it. Because Michigan State could have gotten in there. You know, they, they Bates dropped Michigan State, and then he came back to Michigan State in the summer. And then last year, like around August, around the time that he ended up committing to Memphis, Michigan State was in there. And Michigan State had just had a real good offseason with their current players. Remember the year before, they didn't have an offseason because of COVID. So they're all getting to know each other again. And do you really want to bring that guy in, boom, at the beginning of you know September? Just drop him in there. A guy that's going to expect everything ran for him. A guy that's not going to be want to be want to hear that hey you got to box out, or hey you got to you got to go over that screen on this guy. Don't try to shortcut around it. He's not going to want to hear that, and neither is his dad. And in February, you could have a Jalen Johnson situation where he could quit. That's kind of what I was hearing last September and October. Now we get to February. Sure as crap in Memphis, did he quit? I'm not sure if he quit. I don't. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say that. I wish the kid well. I hope that he gets it straightened out and whatever, whatever. But you see Michigan State's pretty good right now. I'm not saying Michigan State's great, but um, it's my understanding, you know, one or two assistant coaches were like, nah, Izzo, we don't need that. We're good. MJ says, hello from Hong Kong. Michigan State alumni 07. All right, MJ, you take care of yourself over there. Be good. I'm not going to say anything political. YT Spartan says, isn't Tuck top five? Top five, yeah. Hayden Vitcher says, Tuck is the highest paid African-American head coach in the United States, more than Mike Tomlin. MJ says, it's a laughable how terrible ESPN is. I don't know what, what caused him to say that, but he said it. MJ says, they don't even update Michigan State kids when they commit in their top 300. No surprise there. 
But thanks for letting us know, MJ. You're a good watchdog. YT Sparty says, Michigan really screwed up our schedule with their dumb makeup game. Forces two road games in a row. Yeah, it's not great for the end of the year. It's not great for Michigan State. Fox needs it. TV needs it. Money needs it. Michigan State's going to play three games in the final week of the regular season. Um, not ideal. Not ideal. You're right. Mark Stucker says, Comp, Hoophead in Atlanta. JT Daniels graduated from UGA, so he's a graduate transfer and can play right away. Thank you. That makes complete sense now. Thanks, Mark. I won't make that mistake again. I think I've made that mistake three times this week on the air. It's hard to stay abreast on all this stuff. I try to, but... I commit a lot of errors. Try not to, but it happens. Oh, goodbye. Says, what is your opinion about Michigan State in the clutch? They have some buzzer beaters, but also must needed free throws. Yeah. Missed the free throw with Bingham late in the Northwestern game. Could have forced overtime and Malik Hall. Missed a free throw. Could have forced overtime against Illinois. No question. Those free throws. And maybe they're eight. Maybe they're 19 and two. I'm not saying they're good enough to be 19 and two. But execution has not been terrible. But the execution can get better as they, they're they going to need more reliability with Max Christie or Gabe Brown, whether it be Max Christie coming off a down screen catch and shoot or you know getting in the lane, rise and fire 15 feet. Showed in the first half against the Michigan game that he can make some difficult shots. Everybody knew that, but he did it in a close, clutch situation there. Even though it was first half, it was still clutch. So if you're a defense playing Michigan State late in a game – Max Christie, increasingly, I think, is going to become a little bit more of a headache. You have to know where he is when you're coming out of, out of your huddle and there's 12 minutes to go and 12 seconds to go in the game. Might have been the case for Maryland the other night. When they came out of the huddle, what do you think they were talking about in terms of the primary threats? Now Malik Hall, when he set up on that screen roll replace and started to go for the three-pointer, Scott got out on him quick. So you know that in the, in the huddle, Danny Manning was telling Scott, hey, we're closing out on 25. But I suspect in the huddle they were drawing up plans for down screens for Max Christie. I, I suspect they might have thought the ball was going to Christie. And then what, do, what are they going to do if they run ball screen and, and the point guard Tyson Walker is coming off a ball screen? Are you going over that or under it? you got to know that too. So Michigan State's got some threats there. Not all of them are proven. They're still under construction. But the potential is there for Michigan State to have a four-pronged offensive half-court headache for some teams if they get their crap together. That's what they're working on, and Izzo's usually pretty good at it. Peter Ewell says, Comp, best burger in East Lansing is? I'm going to go with Crunchies. Got to go with Crunchies. Not sure I've had all of them, all of them lately. Back in the mid-'80s, Late 80s, I, I liked Crumbly Burger. You guys remember Crumbly Burger? That was a concept. Kind of like that. Big John Steak and Onions does not count as a burger. And I know it's a chain, but it's a flint born chain. So it's a semi-local chain. I like that red sauce. Got to stay away from the buns, though, because of uh, gluten. You know, So burger, uh, I got to get the gluten-free buns, so that makes me... Um, a drag. Can't help it. Gordon Tenona says, no what a burger or in and out. All right, in and out burger. Let me tell you about in and out burger. Me and Kona Dyke were out there in Pasadena for the Rose Bowl in 2013. And, you know, had a pretty good time at the Rose Bowl. But I had a real bad losing streak in, term, in terms of food options. I could tell you the whole story, but one thing after another, food options, the tablecloth just kept getting yanked out. Plans yanked, plans yanked. So me and Conan Dyke were at the press conference, the last press conference prior to the prior to the Rose Bowl. must have been in the afternoon on December 31st. And we were there, and we had to get something to eat on the way back to the hotel, and we we're going to get some work done, and then we we're going to go out, whatever, probably, or something. I don't remember. My boy Crowley was having a party. Thumbs up to Crowley. Uh, so we were hungry, and there was no food at the Rose Bowl uh, press conference, which surprised us a little bit. So we had to kill a couple birds with one stone. Hey, there's In-N-Out Burger. I've heard about this. It's pretty good, right? So we go, we take an exit, and we go over to In-N-Out Burger. 
And there's a big, long line. Oh, yeah, this is what I hear about. It's great, right? Okay. So they come out to the window, take the order to try to exp expedite things. Finally get it. And um, I guess you're supposed to order. I found out later. You're supposed to order it commando or something like that. I don't know. Got it. And me and Konadike, we're still talking about things. And he's, he's like loading up the video in the car. And we, we got our food and we're eating. And I'm like halfway through my hamburger. And I'm like, and I look at, look at it. And I look at Paul and I point at it. And I'm like, what's the big deal? It's a hamburger. It was fast food hamburger. I, it did not live up to the hype. What a burger. I've been through what a burger in Texas and it's solid and it's good. What a, you know, Culver's is kind of the what a burger of the Midwest. Plus they've got the pot roast sandwich and depending on which which one you're which of your local participating Culver's you go to, you might even get some walleye. But it's fried so I can't have that the gluten thing. Um but, I mean, you know, those are chains, right? Those are all fast food. So I'm going with Crunchies. Good question, though. Kazoo Green says, did not realize there was a Spartan Mag live tonight. I was just on YouTube watching a tight cut video of the 1984 Michigan-Michigan State football game, and this popped up. Well, I'm glad it popped up, and the reason it popped up is because we got a lot of people doing a thumbs up, and that's why, why the thumbs up helps alert people like Kazoo Green that we got a Spartan Mag live going on past midnight on a Thursday on a snowy night in East Lansing, Michigan. And as long as my voice holds up, I'll keep rolling. We still got a decent smattering of people watching right now, so we're going to keep rolling. The 84 Michigan Michigan State football game, that's when Harbaugh was injured. So Michigan had to bring in who? Russell Ryan? Uh, Bobby Moore's punt return touchdown with um, Bobby Morse's sister as a cheerleader congratulating him in, in the end zone after he scores. And that Bobby Morse ends up becoming the mother of Max Bulla, right? And and uh, Byron Bulla and Riley Bulla, is that right? That's good fun. Kazoo Green says, "I hope I don't spoil it for anyone. I tell you the, but I tell you the Spartans won nineteen to seven, and Harbaugh broke his arm." Peter Yule says, love Whataburger, lived in Houston for two years, addicted. I hit Whataburger a lot back in spring break 91. South Padre Island. Gordon Tenona says, state one, first big win for Perlis. Kazoo Green said, that Notre Dame win the year before was a big one as well. Gordon Tenona says, it is big and sloppy burgers. Uh, YT Sparty says, Malik Hall, good go-to until you need a free throw. Sad face. Gordon Tenona says, Malik has a big upside. I will take him on my team any day. I agree. And if you get a chance to watch Michigan State from, you know, court side, the size of the players, sometimes you just, it looks different than on TV. And Malik Hall it has a presence about him. He just He's just a big figure type of guy. And he's so... And he's so direct and what's the word that Tucker always uses? Instructive? Intentional? Malik Hall is about the team and Izzo likes him more and more as a growing leader. And more and more Malik Hall is right. And more and more Malik Hall is not afraid to speak out a little bit and keep people in line. He's, Malik Hall is good in a lot of ways and he's shooting a ridiculous percentage. Spartan MD says, smash the like button. Thank you. I appreciate that. Smash it. Nicholas Ruckert says, Izzo, a.k.a. all-time developer. He is in a lot of ways. That's true. Uh, young, young Go Best says, question for later, comp. What is your assessment of Andrew DePop? I just went through that one. I mean, these questions are from a couple hours ago, but uh, I went through DePop a minute ago with the uh, video for those of you that are just joining in. Spartan Marinelli 87 says, I've been waiting all week for this show. Go green. We need a lot of work. Marinelli says, Hauser is playing confident now. Gabe Brown is in a slump. Marinelli's all fired up, man. He's all fired up. I respect that. Gordon Tenona says, Andrew DePape has a great motor. I agree with that, too. I'm off planet says, what are Michigan State's chances with Dante Moore? 
I'm going to say Michigan State is right now. I, I I think they're the team to beat, not by a wide margin, but you know some heavy hitters are going to come in and be coming in after him. But I think Michigan State is the team to beat. Streetwise says hello from Shanghai, China, brothers. Take care of yourself. Great to be ch- chiming in from Shanghai. Where are the Olympics at? Shanghai, where are they at? Beijing? How far is that from Shanghai? Going to the Olympics? John Hammer says, or is it Jan Hammer? I love that Miami Vice theme that he did a few years back. Glad to have him here on the VCast or on the Spartan Mag Live. He says, we need a leader to step up. Hard to become one, but it must be done. Uh, Malik Hall is the guy. But it's better if your point guard is the guy. But you're right. They need some of that. They need a lot of, they need, they need a few things. Streetwise says, we look really unselfish, and I think that's a big part of this team's character and a key to their chemistry. Hoping somebody can begin to emerge as that fiery, give me the ball late game guy, though. That could be Hall. Lawson or T- Tyson Walker doesn't seem to have it in him, but he could be that guy. But, you know, if you're that guy that always wants the ball at the end, percentages say you're going to be unsuccessful at least 40% of the time. If you shoot 60%, which nobody shoots 60% unless you're super clutch at the end. I mean, I remember watching Illinois earlier this year against Arizona, and I can't remember if it was overtime or what, but there was a late-game situation, and Curbelo just over-dribbled the ball. Then the next game, Illinois lost to somebody else, and Trent Frazier, at the end of the game, just over-dribbled the ball. So even if somebody wants the ball and wants to take it over, there's always a chance it's going to look a little wonky. Is wonky the new word? It's perfect. That's the new word. I hear that a lot these days. And it works in a lot of areas. When I'm searching for a word and I can't think of a word, and wonky works. What do we have here? You guys are talking amongst yourselves. Cop wearing a chain, chain, chain check. No, I'm not wearing a chain. Nope. Chain don't break. Never break the chain, but no, I don't have a chain. All right, I think we might be about done. What else we got here? Good thing. John Hammer says, good thing on the ball side, a bench that can be starting on many other teams. I agree. John Hammer says, Joey, an all-around workhorse. Ilzo loves him, always has him. All-around workhorse, I mean, Hauser's getting there. You know, Diabati beat him for a board one time, but Hauser's getting, becoming solid. I don't know if Michigan State has a lot of those junkyard dog types that you need, but I think Hauser's more of a, primarily a shooter that's trying to develop those other areas, but I appreciate your sentiment. You might be right. I might be wrong. Streetwise says, yeah, I think the depth is tougher and tougher to develop these days with availability in the portal. Guys don't stick around for long, etc. Streetwise says, yeah, he's always got a Gordon Sutan type, right? Yeah, Sutan wasn't necessarily a junkyard dog tough guy. He was a skilled guy. Most outstanding player in the Midwest Regional in 2009 in Indianapolis. Really came along as a skilled guy and had a really nice career in Europe. Not the most rugged guy. He could get in there and he had long arms, so he could get in there and get the rebound for you once he was forced to. But, you know, not a natural Antonio Smith rugged junkyard dog type. But you're right that Michigan State often has a Sutan type. You know, Ballinger, you know, you know, those stretch four guys, Sutan. Malik Hall, Kenny Goins. A little bit more of those guys put it on the deck a little bit more. But Sutan was underrated in his ability as a passer. They'd run offense through him, making decisions and things. Streetwise says, I think the best asset is his free throw shooting and the occasional hit from three. I think he's talking about Hauser. Old Tuck says, the bell cow from wintry Austin is here. Jim Harbaugh is one of the oddest ducks in organized football. And he knows Mel has him in the deep water. That's what Old Tuck says coming in from Austin, Texas. Old Tuck is late. Chris Martinez says, where does Michigan State stand with Dante Moore? I'm going to say Michigan State's the leader. Dante Moore's not saying that. I'm just checking the tea leaves. I'm reading the 
fundamentals and the particulars and the brain waves and the vibes. I think Michigan State's a team to beat. I'm not predicting they're going to get them. I'm just saying at this stage, I don't think anyone is doing better than Michigan State right now for Dante Moore. Old Tug says, is Brown in a slump or is the lead dog role beyond his sphere of capability? Uh, great question. Fair question. I'm going to say what I said when Conan Dyke was here. He's a streak shooter. He's doing his best. I thought he, he'd, he'd become more than a streak shooter earlier in the season, but he's kind of regressed to being a streak shooter. And right now he's on a cold streak. Streetwise talking draft mock drafts and apparently Max Christie is higher than Imani Bates yeah Imani Bates uh, that stock is uh, plateauing a little bit John Hammer says Max Christie just seems about to let loose and be the star here very soon thanks again to Chris Martinez we gave you one of these earlier. Thanks, Chris. And when you do that, you can, add a, you can add a question, Chris, next time. And we'll try to put your question right at the top. If I see it, I don't have the greatest vision. That's why I wear glasses, but I still don't have great vision even with them. Chris Martinez says, Ma Nate Note is a thumper. Um, he had that nice hit in special teams causing the fumble. Not the biggest linebacker. Move, he's moving better. I didn't think he moved real well when he was in high school. I thought that I thought that he was going to be like a four star, like Shane. What's his name? The guy with the beard from Cincinnati Molar a few years ago. Good kid, nothing against him, but he was just a little bit slow. Not Teote for a four star guy. I thought his junior film in high school was a little bit slow. Then his senior film, senior film was not available, and I didn't see it until signing day. And he was a little quicker. He'd improved. And then this year he slimmed down a little bit, or he, re, re, he changed some weight or something, and got a little quicker, and didn't look, you know, like out of place slow like Shane what's his name did nothing against Shane I just can't think of his last name so he was a little bit better not to OJ, was actually a little bit better than I feared is feared the right word it's not like I'm afraid or a little bit better than I expected I don't want to say expected I was concerned for him at Michigan State that you know might not be all there at, at like a four-star clip there's a lot of people out there that if you get a four-star you know this guy's gonna be great he's the best come on not always and I thought that he was more of a three-star guy. But um, came along. He was the number five linebacker. And the number four linebacker finished the season number three linebacker after Klein transferred out and after Cravers Crouch got injured or whatever and started making more of an impact on special teams. Ended up doing nicely for a redshirt freshman. No, no, he's not a redshirt freshman. For a true freshman. For a reserve true freshman. Um, I thought that it was a nicely productive uh, stair step season for a freshman, and, he, and 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 you know a little bit more than I would have thought based on the junior film, regardless of the stars. So thumper, I mean, when I think thumper, I think Max Bulla, right? Um, or some others that have been pretty good hitters over the years. I think he, I think Ma could be you know kind of a kind of a good all around linebacker if he keeps coming around. I appreciate your opinion, but that's the way I see it. I might be wrong. A lot of basketball talk here. Appreciate that. Um, Austin Evans just got home from hockey practice. Where do you, where you play hockey at, Austin? High school hockey practice? Streetwise says Tyson Walker has shown flashes, but he's still making adjustments. I'd agree with that. Streetwise says he's automatic from the free throw line, so I'd like to see him get to the rack and draw a foul and open things up for our wings a bit more on a kick. I would too. Tyson Walker's got more to give. And Izzo's still working on him to be aggressive and to be more confident. They say that when Tyson Walker makes a mistake, he takes it really hard on himself. It's good to know what you did wrong and to try to try to make improvements or corrections, but you also have to have a little bit of a short memory too, like a like a corner in football. Uh, 
What else we got here? Hope Collins stays. I think he's got some football. Chris Martinez says, I hope Eli Collins stays. I think he's got some good football in front of him. He's capable. He's proven. He's got to stay healthy. Slim Pickens. Greetings from Retirementville in sunny Florida. Go green. Slim Pickens. Showing off down in Florida. Slim Pickens just now getting the word on the Harbaugh stuff. Uh, Kazoo Green says, I don't know, Comp. They seemed pretty obnoxious starting about five minutes after that Ohio State win. I think it was like with five minutes left in the Ohio State game. And yeah, they were obnoxious, but only for like four weeks. They didn't have like the usual, you know, from June all the way to, you know, November. That, that thing, talking about Michigan fans this year. Kazoo Green said it was nearly two decades of disappointment coming out in chest beating and getting in people's faces. I don't live in Kalamazoo, so I didn't experience that. I'm sure there was some of that around here too, but I don't I don't see people very often. I've got I've got I've got I've got uh I've got some say so on the people that I do see. So I don't see a lot of those people. Um, Chris Martinez says, Kazoo, you're one of my favorite posters on the board. It's nice to say. Streetwise says, yeah. Plug it in. People making fun of my laptop again. Mr. Bowman asking about Jolt and Joe. Kazoo Green says, thanks, Chris. I just like to show up and say what I think. Gets me in trouble everywhere else and sometimes on the boards. Kazoo Green talking about Jolt and Joe. It was good to have Jolt and Joe with us. All right. All right. A lot of, appreciate everybody with all the all the uh, posts. I think that's gonna be it. Sorry about that dead air. Hunter Page says, does Tyson Walker show flashes of a young Drew Neitzel? Uh, different types of players. Different types of players. Good question, though. Anyway, sorry I had all that dead air there at the end. I was reading through some things. We're going to wrap it up. It's been, what, three hours and 20 minutes? Appreciate everybody playing along. Uh, appreciate everybody showing up for Spartan Mag Live. We'll be back next week. And we'll see what Michigan State looks like. Or they play Wisconsin next Tuesday. We'll see where Michigan State basketball is after that. Rutgers is going to be a tough one. Michigan State better be better play better. In the meantime, Michigan State recruiting marches on. SpartanMag.com is a place to go for coverage and conversation about that. Underground Bunker Message Board. Check it out always. Thanks for playing along. We'll see you next time. Next time, my name is Jim Copperoni, publisher. SpartanMag.com. Go check out SpartanMag.com. Become a subscriber over there. Become a subscriber here. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you.